of algorithms book. I don't know if it's good, but I don't want to advertise it. I haven't read it. Uh, okay. Okay. Looks like it's live. Can you confirm? Uh, yes, it is live now. Okay, good. I forgot one more thing. So I'll make you wait for my little, yeah, also coffee. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Okay, finally. Well, well, we're going to continue the low latency memory that we started last uh, yesterday, and we're going to finish it, and hopefully we're going to cover more of memory controllers. I think these are quite exciting topics. Uh, and I think there's a huge change coming in uh, memory technology uh, going into the future. I'll mention some of those things. And I think they're actually very interesting interaction with machine learning also, as we will discuss. You can still hear me fine, right? I feel a bit weird with this new mask. <laughs> it, it, it feels fluffy. Okay, uh, but before I go into it, uh, I, will, uh, I would like to make you aware of some seminars that are happening in the next week, basically. This is actually on Sunday, uh, November 7th. Uh, Damla, my past PhD student at CMU, my last PhD student at CMU, is going to give a seminar on her thesis, PhD thesis. Basically, she's going to cover everything that she's done over the course of, let's say, six years during her PhD and summarize it during the seminar. And she's worked on, as you can see, uh, hardware algorithm co-design to accelerate genome sequence analysis, a topic that uh, we looked at, but we didn't look at all of these techniques that she's going to talk about. She's going to talk about some cutting edge techniques. And if you're interested in this, I'd recommend attending it. It's on Sunday because she wanted to, it to be on Sunday. This also shows that research doesn't have any time frame, right? Sunday, Saturday, night, day, it doesn't matter, right? You come up with ideas and do your research anytime it suits you. And you can also watch it afterwards, of course, right? You can add, attend it live and ask questions or watch it afterwards. So I'd, I'd heavily recommend this for sure. Uh, the next day, uh, Gennady, uh, who is one of my earlier PhD students at CMU, he's now an assistant professor at University of Toronto, is going to talk about some of his latest research on what he's doing in his group. And he, he's working a lot on machine learning uh, for systems and systems for machine learning, which is clearly a very hot topic right now. And his group has developed a lot of interesting algorithms architectures and tools for machine learning. He gave a prior seminar, I think a few months ago in August, uh, but this time he's gonna fo focus on machine learning tools in action. So he's gonna talk about some of the machine learning tools that are developed by his group as well as benchmarking. So if, you, if you've heard of MLPerf benchmarks, for example, which are being adopted by industry heavily today, he's one of the early developers of the MLPerf benchmark. He did this after his PhD. His PhD was on compression in the memory hierarchies. And after his PhD, he moved on to different topics. I think that's the beauty of being a researcher, right? Whenever you want, you can move to, after you make uh, significant contributions to an area, it's always a good idea to move to some other area, maybe related, maybe something that you have been developing in the back of your mind, uh, and then make contributions on that important area. And Gennady is a very good example of that. So I'd recommend attending this also, even though this is a bit different from the topics that we're covering. And finally, uh, again, last, last next week, finally, this is a little bit farther from our area, uh, but still it's related to the genomics area that we have been discussing. Uh, Sergey, who is a collaborator at the University of Southern California, uh, he will give a talk on opportunities and challenges of computational data-driven immunology. We've been collaborating with them uh, multiple, uh, on multiple topics on genome analysis, for example, and tools for uh, genome analysis, and he's going to talk about some research that he has been doing in his lab on this particular topic. Again, if you're interested, I'd recommend attending it. And there, uh, this will be hybrid, basically, a little bit similar to how we're having this lecture. It'll be live streamed online, but it'll also be in a room that is yet to be determined in probably the ETZ building. And again, just a reminder, if you're interested in other seminars, you can find the older seminars and future seminars on this website over here. Okay, any questions on this? Yes, please. 
I think you said once before that um, once you step out of the research world for a few years, it's harder it's hard to go back into it. Uh -huh. um, and yet you said that um, also you should try to switch um, your research fields um, after you've made a breakthrough in one of them. So mm -hmm. like, I don't know, I guess it's confusing to me because in the first one, in, in, in the first scenario, I said, it seems like the reason why you have, um, cannot go back into research is because you're not up to date with the cutting edge and it's not uh -huh. feasible to catch up with it. Mm -hmm. And you have no reputation, I guess, um, after a few years out. Mm -hmm. But for the, um, so how can you switch fields, I guess, if you do not have a reputation <laughs> in the other field and you have no knowledge in it either, you're not on the cutting edge of it? Well, you, uh, I think that's a good question, but uh, you, you basically do the work necessary to switch, right? And this, not necessarily switching a complete field. I'm talking about research topics also, right? You may be working on, for example, memory compression. I'm picking on Gennady on his thesis was on memory compression and he moved to AI machine learning algorithms and architectures. So it's not that far of a fetch. In fact, he looked at the effect of compression, new compression algorithms so that you can actually train the machine learning models much more effectively without uh, requiring very large memories. So there's, there's some synergies between what he, you have, what he had done in the past and what he's doing right now. So uh, I think the generalization is that uh, you play with your strengths, right? I remember the uh, lecture by uh, Richard Hamming. He says you should know your weaknesses and strengths. And if you know that really well, you can figure out how to uh, channel your strengths to an area such that you can be successful. You can make contributions in that area. I would say uh, you will need to learn the area, of course. Right? You will need to do the groundwork. No question about that. Nothing comes for free. And you can do that while you're working on uh, some other topic. So it's, it's like pipelining. While you're working on this topic, you also do some groundwork so that you can actually get started in some other area after you're, let's say, more or less done with some area. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> like, I think like, one thing I got from that is that like, I, I asked like, how you can be cutting edge in some, in some other field. I guess like if you bring expertise from topic A into, into like somewhat mm -hmm. related to topic B, Mm -hmm. then actually you've created a new field, which is A and B, mm -hmm. I guess, or A or B. And, um, and you would be, by definition, cutting edge in this new field, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but exactly. That's one way, basically. That's certainly one way. Playing, uh, bringing your expertise that you're really good at and that you've discovered something and applying it to some other area can enable you to actually uh, be almost immediately cutting edge, let's say. You still need to know what's going on in that other area, right? You cannot just say, okay, I'm going to apply A to B. That may require a lot of adaptation. Yeah. Yeah. But there, uh, there are many other approaches to research. I know people who've been working on the same area for decades and decades also, right? Very similar topics. Uh, it may be good, right? Depending on what you're trying to achieve. And depending on the results that you generate, right? Some areas are so fundamental that uh, if, you, if you achieve some fundamental results, you will have quite a good impact either in the short term or the long term. Okay, maybe we should have research philosophy lectures or some <laughs> some type. Okay, uh, cool. Okay, so remember we are talking about low latency uh, architectures. Uh, we're going to finish them today. Just to jog your memory, uh, we've been talking about how to reduce latency by changing the design of the memory microarchitecture. And uh, the second reason for the long memory latency was the one size fits all approach to latency specification, the fixed latency mindset. And we've been talking about how to reduce that by having heterogeneous latencies for different temperatures and heterogeneous latencies for different DRAM chips. And this is where we stopped. Well, we, we did discuss adaptive latency DRAM, which provides that kind of heterogeneous latency for different temperatures as well as different DRAM chips. And then we asked the question, is there also latency variation within a chip across different parts of a chip? And we're going to talk about that. Uh, that was the next question we asked in our research also while we were, well, we're still looking at latency. Uh, but not as much as we're looking at, uh, we were looking at in the past, perhaps. So that's another example of how research areas come and go, right? You, ex uh, you explore some topic for, for some, some time, and you answer a lot of interesting questions that no one has answered. And maybe questions become fewer and fewer to answer at some point. So you work on some other areas, and then maybe some other questions come based on what your work in some other areas, and then this area becomes invigorated again, right? So that's, that's interesting, I think. 
Uh, but yeah, this is that's the question we wanted to answer, part of a DRM chip. So we did a lot of experimental studies, as you can see. This is one experimental study that's not going to show, that's going to show the variation across different chips again, uh, in, a, in the validation of our previous study base. So TRCD is the activation latency. I think uh, the standard is you can see 13.1 nanosecond for the chips that we tested at that time. And we tested basically, you can see 240 chips across many, many rounds, rounds of testing. Uh, and you can increase this and you'll see similar results. So basically you don't get any errors. I think this is at uh, 45 degrees Celsius. You don't get any errors if you reduce the latencies to I think 7.5 nanoseconds. And the uh, standard is 13.1. Well, any errors on any chip that we tested. So you can see how large the margin is at uh, low temperature. And then you start getting errors and that's the distribution of errors. I think this is very interesting to see. Uh, so each data point over here is a different module that we test. You can see that there's a huge distribution at 7.5 nanoseconds activation latency. We're violating the latency clearly. Some chips fail a lot. You can see that their bit error rate is one out of every 10 cells. 10 to the minus one means one out of every 10 cells, right? Some chips don't fail much, right? Bit error rate is one out of 10 to the, 10 to the 10. That's quite low. But still there are some failures as you can see. So clearly there are many, chips with many errors and chips with very few errors. Now, if you keep pushing it, you have to push their latency down to 2.5 nanoseconds and almost all chips, well, all chips have errors and the error rates are quite high. This basically shows that there is a sweet spot where you can push the latencies. And if you can tolerate some of these error rates over here, very few errors, then it's okay to push the latency down. Right? And clearly there's a huge margin. But you, we knew this before based on adaptive latency DRAM. This work just validates that with newer DRAM chips also. It's, it's good to validate your own work before you start some next uh, work uh, in general. Okay, so that's, this is still across chip variation. This doesn't show temperature clearly. This is one temperature uh, point. Okay, and if you, if you actually look at other latencies, not, not the activation latency, you see similar results basically, which, which are not plotted here, but they're plotted in the paper. Now let's take a look at how does that variation, how, uh, how, how is the variation within a DRAM chip? And this is just one example from one chip. Uh, I don't think it's even the entire chip. It may be only a single bank. It's actually smaller than a bank, given the number of rows over here. Basically, this is cached blocks. Uh, think of them as columns, let's say. And these are rows, 16,000 rows over here and 128 cache blocks. And basically, this is, this is looking at what happens when you reduce TRCD, which is the activation latency in the previous picture, to 7.5 nanoseconds from 13 nanoseconds. You can see that most of the plot is white, meaning there is no errors. So what does that mean, basically? The, uh, the uh, color coding indicates the probability of cache line with more than greater than or equal to one bit error. So if you get black, that means that at that location, uh, in the row column, two-dimensional space, you get a, a lot of errors. But if it's white, you get zero errors. So most of it is white. So there are only a few, well, a few is probably understating it, but there are only a small number uh, of columns. You can see that uh, 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 errors are actually concentrated across columns that exhibit errors when you reduce the latency. So we call these weak columns. So this is very similar to the weak cells in retention errors, right? You have some weak cells, that, that exhibit retention errors if you aggressively reduce the refresh rate. And there are some weak columns that exhibit latency errors if you aggressively reduce uh, the latencies with which you can access them. And this could be, I mean, we don't know exactly why this is the case, but this is because potentially a weak sense amplifier, right? A sense amplifier is not fast, it's slow. And sense amplifier controls the entire column, as you know, right? And cells that are connected at sense amplifier uh, can be more faulty if you reduce the latencies. So this is one hypothesis clearly. I mean, it could be something related to the bit line itself, but sense amplifier makes more sense uh, from what we know of the um, uh, architecture because there's a lot more variation that can happen in the sense amplifier. You can have weak transistors uh, and also weak amplification mechanisms. Okay, is there a question or? No, I don't know why it prompted me at, at that point, okay. Uh, is this clear? Okay, so this basically shows that there's spatial locality. And I think there are two observations. There's clearly a spatial locality and most of the chip is still error-free. Even, uh, even when you reduce the latency aggressively. So 
to almost half. It's not exactly half, 13 to 7.5 nanoseconds, but almost half of the activation latency. So you clearly you can exploit these observations in different ways. And this paper that I'm going to mention exploits it in one way, but I believe there's actually many other ways that you can exploit these observations with. And I think the literature is not uh, mature enough to do it yet. Uh, I think there's more work to be done in this area for sure. So the way this paper exploits it, clearly it observes that DRM timing errors or slow DRM cells, if you will, uh, are con concentrated in certain DRM regions, as I showed you. And it proposed a mechanism called flexible latency DRAM. It's a software transparent design that reduces latency. You could imagine making this not software transparent also, but we wanted to make it more adaptable, let's say, and easy. And the key idea is to divide the memory regions, uh, memory into regions of different latencies. And the memory controller uses lower latency for regions with slow cells, higher latency for other regions. So this clearly requires some bookkeeping by the memory controller. If you go back to this figure, Basically, those red, uh, 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 those columns or cache lines that are highlighted in the red columns, you would basically say that I should access them with, I don't know, 13, uh, 10, 10 nanosecond latency, right? Some other latency than 7.5 nanoseconds. And everything else can be accessed. Well, don't ignore these. Somehow the red part ignores these. But you basically figure out which ones have errors at 7.5 nanoseconds and access them at a higher latency and access everything else at a lower latency. And this requires bookkeeping in the memory controller. Clearly, now you have a more complicated memory controller. Right? But we will see the results actually provide a lot of benefits. Does that make sense? OK. So this is another way of exploiting heterogeneous latency. And now we're exploiting at the, uh, it at the within chip level. Uh, OK, so let's take a look at what the benefits would be. So here we're showing activation latency and precharge latency. Uh, and uh, let's see. What am, I, what am I going to say? Uh, so this is the baseline. Clearly baseline operates at the worst case latencies, as we know. And we basically show three uh, DIMMs, three modules that we tested. And these are the latency profiles. Basically, if you look at DIMM3, module three, almost all of the cells can operate at 7.5 nanosecond latency, right? 99%. Module two is a little bit less lucky. Almost all of the cells can operate at 93, uh, well, almost 93% of the cells uh, operate at uh, can operate at 7.5 nanoseconds, but if you look at the precharge latency, 74% of the cells can operate at 7.5 nanoseconds, and everything else operates at 10 nanoseconds without errors. And if you look at module one, it's a bit less lucky. It's still not bad uh, because you can reduce the latency of most cells to 10 nanoseconds, and some of them to 7.5 nanoseconds in this case. So clearly, this is dependent uh, on the module you have. So you need to test every single module so that you can figure out this latency profile. And hopefully, maybe you're guessing where I'm getting at. This is very similar to retention again, right? You need to have an intelligent memory controller to, to do this testing from my perspective. If you have an intelligent memory controller, you do this testing online and you figure it out. And then over time, your latencies get better. And I think that's kind of the definition of intelligence. You, you always get better over time, right? Today, systems are getting worse over time or they're not improving over time. Uh, and you don't basically need to do this testing right away from our perspective. Uh, you can do this testing online slowly while the system is operating, collect a lot of information uh, with minimal disturbance to the system. And maybe three, four months later, your system becomes faster. Right? That sounds good to me. <laughs> Somehow we're, we're doing exactly the opposite in our systems today. <laughs> the systems are becoming slower because, I don't know, memory is getting more error prone, et cetera. And we don't have any intelligence in the memory control attack to figure out what's going on. Yes. And the reason why you do this online rather than during the uh -huh. production of the chip is because the latency parameters might change over time. So that's a good question. Basically, uh, I, I, I mentioned online because I'm, I'm preparing you for some other work that is coming next. But for this, actually, we found out that uh, latency parameters don't change that much. But clearly, we cannot do testing for years and years. Right? We don't know the answer for years and years. We know the answer for weeks and weeks. For if you, so if you, if you do profiling once, your latency parameters can, uh, are good uh, for let's say three months, but we don't know what happens after that. So I think the safe bet is really doing this online as opposed to someone providing this. If, but someone can provide this and uh, you, you can do it exactly the same way we're doing it today, right? Someone can figure out these latency parameters and have uh, in the data sheets different latency uh, parameters for different DIMMs. 
now you have a dim level data sheet or something like that, uh, or at least in the in the dim's uh, non volatile memory, you actually encode this information, right? Uh, so it's doable offline also, I think, because that's the way we do it today, right? We add margin and we do it offline. You can figure it out and add margin and do it offline also. But I think, uh, from, uh, in my opinion, uh, if you really want to be reliable and safe in these things, you, you really want to do it online. Does that make sense? Feel free to disagree. <laughs> because again, we don't know, right? These systems are going to operate uh, out in different conditions. Uh, and five years down the road, we see, for example, uh, that usually older chips have more errors, right? Uh, as, as chips age, based on data center, large-scale data center studies. And again, are they, what kind of errors are they? It's, very, it's not easy to study these errors. In fact, that's a very good research topic. If you can study these aging-related errors in chips, in real chips, uh, and pinpoint the exact causes of these aging-related errors, I think that would be a wonderful study in research. But that's a very hard-to-do study also. Like we can do correlational studies by looking at the memory errors and data centers, as we discussed earlier, right? So some of them can be due to latency errors. Who knows, right? Okay. So these three chips, uh, these three modules, as you can see, have different properties. And the upper bound is, of course, operating every cell at 7.5 nanoseconds in this case. Uh, so we're going to compare the performance improvements that we get uh, by actually operating uh, in the baseline and using these three chips uh, with these latency properties and the upper bound. Now let's take a look at that. Somehow there's a shift. So this one should be exactly at one, but basically uh, this is the baseline and this is across 40 workloads. You can see, read the paper for more detailed explanations and the performance, this is system performance across those workloads. If you, if you use this dim with heterogeneous latencies, you get 13% performance improvement, which is respectable, I would say. If you use the second dim, which has better properties in terms of latency, you get 17%. If you use the next dim, you get 19%. Next dim, if you remember, the dim three has 99% of its cells that can be operated at 70.5 nanoseconds. And the upper bound is very close. So some dims can get very close to the upper bound. In this case, we define the upper bound based on 7.5 nanoseconds, of course, right? You can define the upper bound based on zero nanoseconds and that'll be a much higher upper bound. But I think zero nanoseconds is probably not uh, reasonable unless you're willing to get some errors. Okay, so basically uh, this is the potential. I think there's a lot more work to be done in this exploitation of uh, intra-chip, intra intra-dim variation. Now let's talk about advanced and disadvantages of this. I mean, clearly it reduces sign latency significantly by exploiting the significant within-chip latency variation. So across-chip latency variation was significant. Within-chip latency variation is also very significant, as you can see. Most cells are fast, let me put it that way, faster than uh, what we operate them at today. Uh, but of course, the disadvantage is again, very similar to ALDRAM, you need higher testing costs, right? You need to determine reliable operating latencies for different parts of a chip. In fact, this is, uh, I mean, this may be even harder than uh, uh, across different chips, right? Now you're actually looking at every single cell uh, over here and you need to be very careful. And uh, the other disadvantage is to, to exploit this, your memory control needs to become more complicated, right? Uh, if you do this based on temperature, like we discussed in ALDM, or, or based on uh, multiple different latency levels, it's a bit easier because you're basically changing uh, the latency parameters that you use based on the current temperature, as well as the current DRAM module that you're using. But now within a module, you need to distinguish between different cache lines and cache blocks. And what I just showed you, the picture that I showed you where some cache blocks had uh, errors and other cache blocks didn't have errors. Imagine that being happening in many, many, uh, many, many chips, right? So you need to store this information whenever you, uh, uh, and you need, to, you need to use those latencies based on that information in the memory controller. And of course, if the memory controller is doing online profiling, it, com it, it becomes complicated even a bit more, but we're not talking about that. This paper proposed it in, a, uh, uh, in an offline profiling manner. Somebody profiles these DIMMs and gives you uh, gives them to you and then you adjust uh, to the latencies. Okay, and that's the paper. If you're interested, you can read it. Uh, this is really the first study of the latency variation within a DRAM chip, uh, if you will. Uh, I think it's, it's quite eye-opening, let's say. Okay, I'm not going to talk about this other work. Uh, this other work basically answers some of the questions that you asked, for example, if, 
let's say you profile the arm chip, how long does the profile remain valid? We didn't answer it in the previous work, but this work tries to answer some of those questions. And it actually uh, does, a, does an even more rigorous study, let's say, than the previous one uh, to look at uh, how often you need to profile, et cetera. And, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that. And one of the other interesting things is you can actually use these latency information for reverse engineering the DRAM chips. So this is one example. It's a very, very simple example. Uh, you can see this is the DRAM column and DRAM row. You can see that if you aggressively reduce uh, latencies, you'll get a failure profile. So if you look at this picture, it's similar to the failure profile we saw earlier, except here the latencies are aggressively reduced. So white means no errors. The different shades of gray and black mean that there are different levels of errors, let's say. And you can see that there's a very clean cut between uh, rows uh, 0, uh, 512, uh, 0 through 512 have very similar characteristics, but after that rows 513 to 1024 have very different characteristics. So why could that be? This is really the subarray edge uh, in, a, in a DRAM chip. So this is a completely different subarray than uh, this one at the top over here. So by actually reducing the latencies and observing how observing the error characteristics that you get across different rows and columns, you can relatively easily figure out the underlying, let's say, organization of the DRAM chip. You can figure out the subarray boundaries. Uh, you can, in this case, you cannot figure out the rows, but certainly the subarray boundaries and bank boundaries. That's I think interesting. <laughs> Uh, this is harder to do uh, in, uh, with refresh. So refresh, retention errors actually, as you uh, reduce the refresh rate, the profile that you get, I didn't show you that one, but if you, re if you read the papers, you may have seen them. Uh, the, the bit errors that you get are relatively random across the DRAM chip. So it doesn't give you any information about how the DRAM chip looks like internally. But the latency, because it's very much dependent on the bit lines, uh, bit line characteristics as opposed to individual cell characteristics, it gives you a lot of internal information. So this is how people reverse engineer DRAM chips, for example. In fact, the next one of the next papers that I'm going to talk about reverse engineer the DRAM chips a lot uh, compared to what was known before. Yes, please. Can you press the button? Because others may not hear. I in, forgot that. In terms of reverse engineering, you can always use like a, a microscope or something, right? <laughs> it's the power of this that you have an automated way of reverse engineering it and you can then plug in the structure you gain into some kind of algorithm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you can do this. Uh, so if you have an FPGA, you can do this very easily, right? And you can automate and you can run programs and overnight you run it and you, uh, in the morning you get a reverse engineered chip. With microscope, uh, it's, first of all, it's a lot more expensive. <laughs> and second, uh, yeah, with microscope, I think you can, you can put, you can, you can see the boundaries for sure, yes, but, uh, uh, you may not get every information that you want. For example, what, what's the purpose of reverse engineering? Right? You want to know, uh, uh, I guess, uh, what addresses uh, uh, are actually impacting your row uh, and column numbers. And you can get this information much more easily if you do it without a microscope, with an FPGA. With a microscope, you don't know the addresses. You can see the structure, yes, pictorially, but you don't know which address bits are actually affecting what rate. And you need that address bit. For example, if you want to do a row hammer attack, and if you want to make sure that two rows are adjacent in the same subarray, you need this sort of information, for example. Right. Yes, please. Is there any reason why it's across uh, columns that you have this similar like uh, error rates compared to like, I don't know, across rows? Yeah, yeah. So the, the reason is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, because of the sense that, we, I mean, the, the hypothesis that we have is this error is, uh, dependent on the sense amplifier variation. Because uh, if, you, if you think, these are activation errors, right? Whenever you activate, uh, the, the bit line perturbs the sense amplifier and the sense amplifier starts and restores the charge. And if you get errors, that means that either your bit line is not op operating very well or your uh, sense amplifier is not operating well. Of course, the activation word line may not be operating well, but clearly we don't see that effect on the word line over here. Uh, and uh, we believe that it's because of the noise in the sense amplifier. Different sense amplifiers have different characteristics in terms of their sensitivity to latency, for example, because of the variation. And some of them are slow, some of them are fast. As a result, you get this error profile. That's dependent on the bit line. Yes. 
And then since it's in the columns that you have the error rates, uh -huh. um, how do you properly exploit this? Because at least with uh, the refreshing, it was the row that was then That's right, decided yes. based on it. But here, uh, it, it's the columns that have different yes. directions. So how do you use this different latency? So uh, yeah, uh, columns are essentially mapped to different cache blocks, right? So you need to basically keep track of which cache blocks you can access faster and which cache blocks you cannot access faster. So it's a lot more overhead, yes, no question about that. And the paper talks about this a little bit, but this is still a lot, of, a lot more overhead. That's why I mentioned that there's, there needs to be more work done to really exploit this in different ways. But I think what, what reduces the overhead is this picture that I showed you earlier, right? So uh, this picture looks at it in a more realistic, uh, let's say, reduction in latency, so 7.5 nanoseconds. You get very few errors, right? So you need to keep track of only a small number of cache blocks that you need to access with higher latencies. This one is to show that you can actually do the reverse engineering. Uh, we're not advocating that you should be operating in this uh, error region, let's say. Because a lot of, clearly, a lot of uh, columns have errors in this case, right? You could be operating, sure, yes, but <laughs> you, need to, you need to have a lot more information to keep tracking your memory controller to distinguish which, uh, co which cache blocks uh, you can access with which latency. Okay, cool. So I would recommend reading this paper. I don't have time to really go over it, uh, and, but you can, you can also watch the uh, video uh, of this ICCD talk. Okay, now let's answer some more questions. Basically, you can keep asking questions, right? Once you discover these things. One of the questions could be, how can you exploit this in a more low overhead way, uh, potentially? Uh, I'm not gonna answer that, but you can ask that to yourself and maybe come up with new mechanisms. But one of the questions that we asked is, why is there spatial latency variation within a chip? And I think that's a good question to ask in general. And this is, uh, uh, this is another hypothesis, basically. Clearly, I gave you one hypothesis in terms of sense amplifiers. I think that's true. But there's also another latency variation that's called design-induced variation. The earlier one that I mentioned to you is more a process manufacturing variation, right? Uh, because of the manufacturing process of different sense amplifiers, you may have actually different reliabilities, let's say. But there's also design-induced variation. So if you look at, uh, this is two-dimensional, this is sub right? You have the sense amplifiers, you have the word line drivers. And naturally, uh, cells that are closer to the sense amplifiers are faster, right? Because they can share charge much more quickly because of the interconnect delay, right? Uh, with, the, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the sense amplifiers. Whereas cells that are farther should be slower, naturally, again, intuitively, right? Because of the interconnect delay. Uh, so there's an across row variation, and there's also an across column variation. Naturally, again, because the word line drivers are closer to the cells that are over here, these should be faster. And because the word line drivers need to drive much longer interconnects to actually activate the cells over here, these should be naturally slower. So naturally, again, based on first principles, what you would expect is that this part of the chip should be inherently, of the subway should be inherently faster than this part over here. And roughly, this is what we see, actually. If you read the paper that I'm going to mention, uh, this is what we see. So our intuition, our first principles, are actually validated by the tests that are done on real DRAM chips also. That's a good thing, always. It's always good to bridge this theory and practice, right? But it's not perfect, as we will also discuss. So basically, there's a systematic variation in cell access times because of the physical organization of DRAM as you can see in this picture. And I think this is beautiful. So this paper recognized that, and it proposes a new profiling mechanism. And now this, we're talking about online profiling now. It's called design-induced variation aware profiling. And the goal is to figure out the minimum latency with which you can operate the subrate at. And if this is true, what we see is true, inherently, there's an inherently slow region. You don't need to profile the entire chip. Just profile that inter inherently slow region and figure out what the latency values are. That's the idea, basically. Of course, if you just do this naively, it doesn't work. Uh, well, it's low cost, clearly, because you're not profiling the entire chip right now. You're just profiling this very small region. Uh, but it, uh, it doesn't work because, as we discussed, there is also uh, some uh, uh, process manufacturing-related variation, right? Uh, you cannot just say only, there's only systematic variation, so I'm going to profile this region that's inherently slow, and I'm done. No, because if you do that, you operate the chip uh, with some latency that you found out these cells are good at operating with, but then you figure out these other cells fail. Why do they fail? Well, they fail because they're weak cells. 
meaning weak in terms of latency, just like we've seen earlier. And they're inherently slow because of process radiation. So there are two different types of mechanisms that lead to, uh, let's say, latency errors. One is because of design-induced radiation. You have localized errors over here. Uh, and some cells are inherently slow because of that systematic variation. But some other cells are also slow because of manufacturing variation, process variation. And these are more randomly distributed. That's the interesting part. Uh, and as we know, uh, I mean, they're semi not exactly randomly distributed because of the uh, bit line characteristics, but the bit, line, uh, bit lines are actually randomly distributed according to what we see. Uh, but basically, uh, you can use error correcting to codes to actually correct these. And th this, is the, uh, this is what the paper examines. How do you actually uh, design error correcting codes to correct these nicely, and also use existing error correcting codes to correct these, while you reduce the latency to levels that are uh, determined by these inherently slow regions. So it, pro it, it provides a, I'm not going to go through the dynamic uh, profiling mechanism exactly, but you do dynamic profiling and you, put, you combine it with error correcting codes and you try to figure out a latency parameter uh, that you can operate the DRAM chip reliably with without getting any errors. And for this, you need, an, again, an intelligent memory controller that can do this sort of profiling. And again, you can read the paper for exactly how that profiling is done, but you can imagine, right? You can imagine that the memory controller somehow is aware of the physical structure of DRAM. You can do that by reverse engineering or get information from DRAM, which is probably better. Uh, as we discussed in the past, we need better information about the DRAM internal organization exposed to the memory control in the system. That's another example of that. And then uh, you profile, reduce the latencies for that region and figure out what's going on. And also you, you try to figure out whether you get errors in other regions, right? If you actually reduce the latencies to that level. And if you get errors, and if the errors are not correctable by ECC, then you basically increase the latency a little bit more, right? So that's the profiling mechanism. And if you have enough time, and you have enough time if you actually are doing this offline, uh, but we do it online as we discussed, uh, so that we can, uh, we can adapt to different temperatures, uh, different, uh, I don't know, different uh, types of aging, et cetera. That's what this paper also proposes actually, saying that in order to do it reliably, uh, you should do it really online. Uh, uh, and if you do it at the right times, basically you don't want to stop the system to do this, right? If, if the user is doing something important, you don't want to stop the system to profile your DRAM. You should really do it in the background uh, when the user is not doing anything, for example. For example, this may be a good time my cell phone is doing that, that sort of profiling, right? I'm not touching it. And of course, when I touch it, it should probably uh, wake up quickly. But there are, there are times that are, where systems are idle, right, clearly. And that, those are the times where you should do this sort of profiling, either at a coarse grain idleness or a fine grain idleness. Okay, so let's take a look at the results. So this paper actually does better than ALDRAM. Uh, so this does not exploit uh, uh, within chip variation. So we're still exploiting across chip and across temperature variation here because we're using a single latency parameter for a given chip and for a given temperature uh, combination. And we want to figure out that basically the key contribution of this work is to really figure out that dynamically without any help from anyone online. So it requires error correcting codes, as you can see for that. So if you look at uh, the reduction in read latency, it's significant. These are across a different set of DRAM chips, uh, clearly. Again, the results are validated. Adaptive latency DRAM can reduce latency significantly, but uh, this mechanism is better. Uh, oh, sorry. This is adaptive latency DRAM, as you can see, right? The read latencies are reduced, but the adaptive latency DRAM is not as effective at high temperatures. This mechanism is effective at both low temperatures and high temperatures and more effective than adaptive latency DRAM, as you expect, because we're, we're using ECC and we're also using uh, exploiting systematic variation, not just temperature variation. And there's also an error correcting mechanism that this paper proposes that improves uh, the uh, latencies even more, as you can see. And the right latencies are similar, as you can see over here. So overall, basically, uh, doing this online profiling uh, buys you even better latency reductions that are more consistent across all the temperature ranges that, uh, that we're interested in, let's say. And if you're interested, I'd recommend reading the paper. This is the paper that I mentioned also, reverse engineers the DRAM uh, significantly. You can see nice pictures in this paper that show how latency varies within the DRAM chip and how you can actually see uh, essentially where the boundaries of different uh, subarrays as well as mats. Uh, mat is the lower level. Uh, 
uh, two-dimensional structure that uh, subarrays are composed of, uh, you can essentially see that. And uh, other, other works actually use this sort of uh, understanding to actually reverse engineer uh, DRAM chips as well. Okay, any questions before I jump into advance this? Yes, please. Yeah, I wonder how random it, yeah, are those slow yeah. cells distributed. So is it possible that the silicon has some defect in some part and therefore a row has many yeah, slow yeah. cells so that ECC is not powerful enough? Yeah, yeah, certainly it's possible. Uh, but usually if, if there's a hard defect, uh, that is usually discovered uh, uh, post-manufacturing but before release to the field. So what manufacturers do it, they, they do the testing. If there's a row that's defective, uh, then basically they repair that row by remapping it to another row. Now, it's certainly also possible so for some reason, uh, some of these, uh, when you reduce the latencies, you will get some of these defects, right, in the row. In that case, you will not be able to reduce latencies as much, basically. So correctness is still maintained with this mechanism, but latency reduction is not going to be as much. And of course, if you find some techniques like that, that's one of the reasons why intelligent memory controllers are make sense, right? If you find uh, that one row is limiting your latency reduction, uh, if you have an intelligent memory controller, maybe you remap it to another row if, uh, with, with some of the techniques that we discussed in the last lecture, right? The crow, copy row technique, for example. If you have that flexibility, of course, right? But we didn't do that in this work. Basically, we, if we saw errors, too many errors, then the ECC can handle over here, then you don't reduce latency as much. You keep increasing the latency until you get to a point where ECC can handle all the errors. And if ECC can, cannot handle any errors at reduced latencies, then you use the nominal latency. Yes. I have another question. Um, oh, sorry, did okay. I drop someone in the room? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, so in both the ELISA paper, as well as in the tiered latency paper, I guess we saw that uh, the latency was majorly dominated by um, res charge restoration, right? And not so much, I guess, uh, propagation of the electrical signal. So yeah. I'm surprised that the bottom left should be quicker than the top right if it's mostly about... Well, it's, uh, it's actually charge. a combination of both, right? If, uh, if you, if, uh, it's, it's charge restoration. It's, it's basically charge sensing, amplification, and rest uh, restoration, for sure. So interconnect is a part of it. Okay, so the sensing part is what goes much quicker then, and then the restoration can start earlier. Exactly, exactly. I see, yeah. thanks. It's a whole basically. <laughs> Meaning you need to think of the latency as a holistic thing. It's not just getting the charge out of the cell. Uh, that needs to be, if you have a lot of charge in the cell, for example, then you can perturb the bit line quickly. You can increase the charge uh, quickly in the bit line and the bit line uh, gets the sense amplifier uh, started also quickly. And then the sense amplifier uh, more quickly restores the charge. Yeah, Make sense? thanks. Yeah, sure. thanks. Okay, one more. Yeah, I think this is a related question. So um, in terms of that design induced variation in possible latencies, mm -hmm. um, how does, like, is that of the same like order of magnitude? Um, as the process-induced variation effect on um, possible latencies? Well, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's a tough, uh, tough question. Well, if you, if you look at the numbers over here, uh, of course, these numbers are affected by the mechanism as well, right? Uh, this is, you can, you can think of ALDRAM as exploiting process-induced, right? It's not, induced, it's not exploiting any design-induced uh, variation. So it's reducing latencies at low temperatures by 31%. Design-induced variation reduces by 35.1%. So in a sense, it's adding a little bit more, but it's also making it more robust, let's say. So this paper is not just exploiting design-induced, it's also exploiting uh, manufacturing, uh, process manufacturing-induced variation, but it's also making it more robust. I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, but based on these results, it seems like uh, process-induced variation is buying you a lot to begin with. Right? And the combination is buying you a little bit more. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that um, 
I guess at higher temperatures, it seems that the knowledge of the, the like the, the the structural knowledge is is actually exactly helpful. exactly so. because at higher temperatures, process induced radiation, you have few smaller margin. As a result, you cannot exploit it well. But the systematic variation is, uh, let's say, still there at high temperatures, basically. It's not dependent on the temperature. Whereas the process of uh, manufacturing induced variation uh, is dependent on the temperature, right? Yeah. Okay, very good questions. Okay, let's talk about advantages. So the big advantage over here is, uh, I, I put two pluses over here, as you can see. This work automatically finds the lowest reliable operating latency at system runtime. Meaning that you know, your production uh, testing cost is much lower, right? So if you have an intelligent memory controller that can do this, that's great. Just let it work over time and your system will hopefully get, become better. It reduces latency more than prior methods, but of course it used the ECC to help itself a little bit also. That's why the answer to your question is not perfect, right? We're using ECC over here to correct some of those design, in, uh, to correct some of those manufacturing induced errors as well. So maybe you could argue that it's not a fair comparison because prior works didn't use ECC, but ECC adds more reliability, certainly. And also it reduces latency at high temperatures as well, as we discussed. Now, clearly this has disadvantages also. Now it requires knowledge of inherently slow regions, as we discussed. Either you need to reverse engineer or somebody needs to provide this information. It requires error correcting codes. It imposes overhead during runtime profiling, as we discussed. And as always, you have to have a more intelligent memory controller, which means that it also needs to be more complicated, right? It needs to be capable of profiling. Okay, and this is the paper. Uh, again, if you're interested in reading it, uh, I, I would recommend reading it. It's a long paper, but it's worth reading it. Okay, any questions? Now we're gonna switch uh, gears a little bit and talk about application data. Uh, today we're using same latency parameters or for all application data, but can we actually distinguish between different application data and use different latency parameters with this for, for different application data that have different kind of tolerance to different latencies, uh, different error rates, I should say. And this should remind you of the heterogeneous reliability memory that we discussed in multiple lectures, right? Multiple times. Uh, you have different uh, application data with different tolerance to errors. And you basically design two different kinds of memories. One is reliable, uh, very reliable memory to store the data uh, that is not tolerant to errors, and when it's not so reliable memory, low cost memory, we called it, uh, to store the data that's, uh, 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 that is tolerant to errors basically, but you will get errors in that case. And this is a very similar idea, except we're gonna apply it for the, let's say, uh, the application of the day, which is machine learning inference, right? Uh, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, I'll recommend the paper and uh, I'll recommend the presentation as well. And, That'll be one of the papers. But uh, I mean, I can, I can go into a lot of detail, but I want to get into memory controllers also. But uh, basically, deep neural network inference evaluation, both training as well as in inference, evaluation means inference. Basically, you constructed your model, you feed some inputs, and your neural network, uh, you, that input goes through your neural network, and the neural network gives you the answer, right? Whatever answer you're looking for, classifying it as a cat or a dog, or giving you, uh, I don't know. Uh, the language or the letter recognition, whatever you're recognizing basically with your network. And it turns out this is very DRAM intensive, especially as your network gets larger and larger. If you have many, many layers, uh, these layers don't necessarily fit uh, in your caches. As a result, you go to DRAM a lot. I don't have the numbers here, but the paper and other papers actually have numbers. In some cases, your, uh, 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 your, uh, and we're gonna have a guest lecture about this actually in, uh, maybe next week or the, next, the week after that. Uh, but in some cases, uh, more than 90% of the inference time is spent waiting for DRAM. Very similar to what we have seen for some other workloads. This, this is true for large networks. If your network is small, let's say five uh, layers and it fits in your caches, then it's not DRAM intensive, but it's probably not as interesting also today. So, okay, this work observes that some data and layers in neural networks are very tolerant to errors. And because you have, you're processing different data, different weights, in your neural network, and not all of them are equal. And the key idea is to reduce DRAM latency and voltage. We're gonna talk about voltage, but we also reduce voltage in this case on such data and layers. So if the layers uh, and the data, input data is tolerant, and the network is still going to give you the right answer accurately, 
why not just reduce the DRM latency and voltage? Of course, this requires characterization of which data is tolerant by how much there is and how much accuracy loss you will get if you actually uh, inject some error rates into your network based on the latency reduction. Right? And of course, this is not enough. Uh, you should still achieve a user-specified accuracy target. Uh, but you can also, this is a feedback loop basically, meaning you know what kind of error rates you're gonna get if you reduce the DRAM latency and voltage. And you can actually retrain your network, retrain your model, readjust the connections in your neural network such that it can adapt to these errors. That's the beauty of uh, retraining or training neural networks, right? You can, you can retrain uh, with, with the error rates that you're getting in DRAM. That's the idea. So this is very interesting, I think, but uh, basically we call the data aware management of DRAM latency and voltage for deep neural network inference. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail, but let me give you an example. So these are uh, weights and input, input feature maps of uh, some neural network that's used heavily. It's not the state of the art, ResNet 50. I don't know how many layers it has. You can read the paper, but it's, it's, some, it's something reasonable, but it's not the state of the art clearly. Even a network like this is actually quite DRM intensive according to our results. But you can see that some of the weights can tolerate a lot of errors, right? And input feature maps. You can see that if the, Mac, uh, if the error rate is 8%, uh, then you can still tolerate the errors because you still reach your accuracy target. But some weights and some input feature maps don't, cannot tolerate errors. You can see that the maximum tolerable error rate is about 2% over here. So if you have this characteristic, if you profiled your network, if you know the characteristics of the inputs and weights very well and error tolerance of your data really well, what you can do is, do is you can map more error tolerant layers to DRAM partitions with lower voltage and latency. In this case, I mean, in, in one uh, example uh, evaluation in this paper, the paper uses four DRAM partitions with different error rates. And the latency and voltage of the partitions of DRAM are tuned to match the error rates that are tolerable. So you map these uh, to um, a DRAM partition that has latency and voltage that gives you a 2% error rate, let's say, or less than 2% error rate. You map these to a DRAM partition that gives you a less than, I don't know what that is, 4.5% error rate. And then this is 8%, I think. No, oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea basically. Now this requires characterization of your neural network as well as your DRAM. So it's really a co-design of uh, the neural network plus DRAM. And also you need to do this retraining as we discussed if you really want to be accurate. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Basically, the goal is to enable accurate and efficient inference using approximate DRAM. This is also called approximate DRAM because it's not going to give you the correct answer all the time. It has some bit error rate associated with it, right? And there's, it's an iterated process, basically. So uh, you have baseline neural network and an accuracy target. And essentially, you uh, characterize your uh, error tolerance. You get an error profile. And there's a mechanism called boosting that can be employed uh, either at the beginning or later, as we will see. Uh, but basically, after you do the error characterization, uh, error tolerance characterization, you have the error profile, and then you do the DRAM characterization, you have the DRAM error profile, and you do the mapping like we discussed, right? Uh, and you get a final uh, deep neural network over here. And then you basically calculate its accuracy. If its accuracy is not enough, you basically retrain the network. That's called what's boosted DNN over here. And then you do the mapping again. You keep trying the mapping basically such that you can achieve the accuracy target that you want. So it's an iterative process in the end, just like how neural networks are trained today. But the, other, the additional equation is here, uh, you have the DRAM error profile and you, you try to match the DNN error profile. And I guess if you can match it really well, you'll, you'll be accurate. But that, uh, even if you match it really well, you may not be completely accurate because uh, just because some weights uh, can tolerate some error doesn't mean that the combination of those weights uh, map to different uh, map to the uh, partitions uh, that can tolerate the errors that each of the weights can tolerate uh, will lead to an accuracy that's good enough, right? Because when you when you when you check your uh, DNN, you check what, uh, each weight and its tolerable error rates uh, alone individually, not in conjunction with all of the other uh, weights. That's why you need to do this retraining basically to make sure that your accuracy is maintained. Does that make sense? 
Okay, for more detail, you should read the paper. We don't have time, but the results are quite uh, interesting. Basically, uh, on CPUs, you get significant DRAM energy reduction while maintaining accuracy within 1% of the original. And there's clearly a curve that shows how the energy reduction changes uh, when you actually change the accuracy target. Uh, and you can also see that you can even get a system speed up, uh, which is kind of not very expected, but uh, uh, this is because uh, the neural networks are not really optimized for the CPU in general. We will see the results on the accelerators in a little bit. Uh, but basically, you get significant savings in terms of energy and performance. And we're, we're just using uh, scaling in terms of latency over here. Uh, we do also evaluate on GPU. As you can see, the energy reductions are even higher. And IRIS is, was at the time the state of the art accelerator. Uh, you get energy reduction over here. And TPU is the edge TPU. Well, I, I don't think this is the edge TPU, this is the Google TPU tensor processing unit that we show pictures of uh, in, in earlier lectures. Again, you get significant energy reductions. So you don't get performance improvements over here because neural networks are actually very optimized for performance for streaming the data from the DRAM, but you get significant energy reductions uh, in these uh, work, uh, systems. Okay, and that's the paper. I'd recommend you take a look at it if you're interested. Again, this will be one of the potential readings that you can get extra credit for. And we had a guest lecture about this in the last uh, years, but this year we have some other guest lectures. So you're not gonna get a le guest lecture on this one probably, uh, but you can also watch the video from last year. I think this is the one from fall 2019. Uh, as you can see. Okay, any questions? So I think this is very interesting because now uh, we're not just changing the latency, but we're also trying to adapt the latency to the application characteristics, right? And this is very similar to what I discussed earlier. This is just to jog your memory. There's no difference in a sense from the conceptual view of the heterogeneous reliability memory we have seen earlier, except we've just applied it to neural networks in a very concrete use case, meaning adapt the DRAM latency and voltage uh, to the vulnerability level or memory error tolerance level of different data types. But this picture still remains basically. You can, you can change the vulnerable data. Well, vulnerable and tolerant data can be expressed with error rates and the reliable and memory and low cost memory can be expressed with error rates that they provide uh, based on the latency and voltages uh, that they're configured with, right? Yes. Um, I don't really understand how the, the latency can be. So it seems like the latency was improved pretty significantly by the energy reduction. So I guess I don't see if how uh, machine learning uh, tasks are so um, band or I guess are, are so uh, memory limited. Um, how is it that they have no speed up if you would decrease your latency by like, say, I don't know, like, like 20% or something? Because, uh, because there's a lot of prefetching that's happening in the system. So if you look at a state of the art machine learning accelerator, it does a lot of good prefetching mechanisms. It has a lot of good prefetching mechanisms at least for these uh, neural networks that we examined. There's also software prefetching. <laughs> yeah. So does that mean that, um, that they're, not, they're not actually waiting for, or, so are they still waiting for data most of the time? Uh, okay, it, on the CPU, yes. On the CPU, in many, in many cases, yes. Uh, and also we're not reducing all of the latencies. I should also say that over here. We're just reducing the activation latency here. Uh, there, uh, there are other rate latencies that they could be uh, waiting on. Uh, but on, on, on the accelerator, they're really designed for the accelerator. So the accelerator does a lot of buffering and pipelining uh, to make sure that you're minimizing the weight for data. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's not immediately intuitive because yeah. like, if you're waiting for data 50% of the time and then you've directly reduced that latency and it seems to me that it should translate to a to a non-trivial uh, speed up. Speed up, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll so I think uh, it, it really depends on the system that we test. That's why you see speed ups in the uh, CPU, right? In the CPU, they're waiting for data, uh, but in the, in the other systems, there's a lot of overlapping of the latencies that are going on. Yeah, but I think uh, whole, uh, you, you will see a, a guest lecture on uh, similar issues. So maybe you can ask more questions on that, on that topic. So this is not the end of this topic. And also, I think I, sh I should also mention that uh, the neural networks that we tested in this are not as intensive as the real neural networks out there, let's say. So the real big neural networks that are going to be discussed in the guest lecture uh, are much more intensive in terms of DRAM. So we, the, one, the ones we had access to over here are not as intensive, let's say. 
So maybe you will get latency reduction, you, you'll get significant performance improvements in the accelerators as well, as we will see in the guest lecture actually, uh, that we don't see over here. Okay, okay, so I, this is again, just to jog your memory. Uh, this is essentially what we're doing basically, right? If you remember this picture, we're characterizing and classifying application memory error tolerance. We're just looking at one application in this case, and we're looking at different vulnerability levels, and we're mapping the application data to the heterogeneous reliability system with software hardware cooperative solutions. So that's why I think this is an example of heterogeneous reliability memory, which was proposed much earlier, as you can see. But it was applied for a different purpose for different workloads. Okay. Well, we're, we're not done quite yet. Uh, we should probably talk about voltage also. Any other questions so far? Okay. So let's talk about voltage a little bit. I'm not going to cover, again, I, I want to give you a broad overview. If you have to go to every single paper in detail, it'll actually take, much, take us much longer. But every single detail, every single paper has a lot more detail than what I discuss. I, I, I'm just giving you the key insights, let's say. I think this is very interesting. This was the next question we asked, basically. What about voltage, basically? If you put another variable into the equation, not just latency reliability, but voltage as well, how do the curves change now? And this becomes very interesting. And that's, this is the paper. This was part of my student, Kevin Chang's dissertation also. So there are several key questions. How does reducing voltage affect reliability? How does reducing voltage affect DRAM latency? Meaning, uh, if you reduce voltage and if you get errors, can you recover them by increasing the latencies, for example? What is the relationship here? And how do we design new DRAM energy reduction mechanism? And the paper answers all of these questions. We're going to look at some of them. And the paper is, again, experimentally answers these questions. Clearly, we'll have some theory uh, in terms of uh, how voltage and latency relationship behave. And we did have that hypothesis, but we need to test it. And the infrastructure to test it was not easy to build, basically. Uh, basically, uh, if you look at DRAM modules, you need to adjust the supply voltage to every chip on the same module. And we built, essentially, we adapted the soft MC infrastructure to adjust the supply voltage in a controllable way. Uh, yeah. So we have a voltage controller that enables us to do it. And you can actually find this online as well. And we tested a number of low voltage DRAM chips to begin with, because we don't want to look at high voltage DRAM chips because clearly we, there's a huge margin over there. Well, that's the hypothesis at least. But we thought that studying low voltage DRAM chips is better because if we show a margin in the low voltage DRAM chips, then that's even more interesting, right? Because these are designed to be low voltage to begin with. And you can see that's the voltage level uh, that's used by these chips, 1.35 volts, uh, volts at the time, whereas the high voltage chips are 1.5 volts. Okay, you can see uh, the details in the paper. But basically what we did was we, wanted, uh, we tested these chips uh, iteratively uh, uh, under a wide range of supply voltage levels from 1.35 to 1 volt. So that's only a 26% reduction, but voltage is actually quite sensitive. So let's take a look at experimental results. This is our experimental results. This is a nominal voltage, 1.35. From right to left, we're reducing voltage. And on the y-axis, we see the fraction of cache lines with errors. But what is the percentage of cache lines with errors? 100%. This is basically every cache line is an error. You don't want to be there clearly. And this is clearly zero, as you can see. So at 1.35, you'd better be at zero, right? Because that's the nominal operating voltage that's specified. And you're at zero. And different vendors, and this, uh, this is the distribution that got different chips of different vendors, as you can see. But different vendors have different characteristics. So vendor C, for example, has very small margin in terms of voltage, whereas vendor A and vendor B have very large margins comparatively. And this is the behavior of the curve. As you reduce the voltage, at some point, you start getting errors relatively quickly. And clearly, we, we don't have very fine grain control over voltage over here. You can see that our voltage steps are 0 0.05 volts. Maybe this curve is smoother, let's say, if you actually can do fine grain control of voltage, right? It, it looks like a huge jump from 1.3 to 1.25 over here, but maybe this curve uh, jumps more slowly if you look at finer grain steps, right? But still, it's a huge jump from that at that point. And that's true for most vendors, let's say. Okay, so clearly, well, I guess I've already described all of this. So basically there's a minimum voltage without errors and that is different based on the manufacturer. There's a margin in voltage. Some manufacturers have high margin, some manufacturers have low margin. As you can see, the vendor C has low margin. And reducing voltage below Vmin causes an increasing number of errors, clearly. But the behavior of the curve is different. 
Okay, so this is interesting. Clearly, there's variation across vendors, variation across chips. Uh, we don't look at intra-chip intra variation because we couldn't have the means to test intra-chip variation. We cannot change the voltage inside the chip in this particular case, at least. But we'll see some results later. Now, let's look at the theory. Uh, so this is theory. This is circuit simulation. So we did detailed circuit simulations of DRAM cell arrays to model the behavior of how supply voltage gets affected by latency. So this is supply voltage on the x-axis, latency on the y-axis. And the latency is the minimum latency that you should use so that you don't get any errors at a given voltage level. And the curve looks like this, basically. So at the normal voltage, you have some latencies, as you can see. As you reduce the voltage, you should increase the latencies. Why? Because as you reduce the voltage, the circuits are operating more slowly. If you really want to, for example, the activation sensing uh, to complete, you should give the circuit more time, right? So that the uh, sensing completes because you're operating at a much lower voltage. That's the idea. It's not rocket science, clearly. We know this actually from CPUs, right? As you reduce the voltage, you can operate at lower frequencies. You cannot push the frequency as high, right? It's, very, it's a very similar uh, behavior. It's, but it's good to see that in circuit simulation. And these are two different latencies, activate and precharge, as you can see. So this is theory. This is what you would expect. So basically, reliable low voltage operation requires higher latency. Now you, you have a trade-off space, right? You can say, I want to minimize latency. Well, go and operate at high voltage. You can say, I want to get a sweet spot between energy efficiency and latency. Well, explore the trade-off in this curve, basically. Maybe if you operate at 1.0 volts, you can be much more energy efficient. Because remember the power equation, it's CV square F, right? Dynamic power. It's, uh, it's, it's basically uh, quadratically related to voltage. And if the frequency is also related to voltage, which is the case, uh, dynamic power is really a cubic function of voltage. So it can actually reduce dynamic power greatly if you reduce voltage. Okay, so that's the idea. And then maybe you can tolerate the latency somehow. I don't know. But th that's the goal of this paper, basically. Get a sweet spot in terms of energy and uh, performance. Now let's take a look at uh, how this uh, pans out in practice. So this is theory. This is purely simulation. Now this is practice. The curve looks very similar, right? This is the measured minimum latency that does not cause errors in DRAM modules. And this is, I think, uh, I don't remember. I think this was one vendor, but all, all vendors are very similar. Or maybe it's, it's, it's all vendors, I don't know. No, no, this is one vendor because clearly we don't get errors over here. In, uh, we do get errors at 1.30 in vendor C, for example. So this is one of the vendors. Uh, you can see that 100% of the modules are reliable at 1.35 volts if you operate that, if, you, if your activation latency is 10 nanoseconds. And that's the, that keeps being the case until you get to 1.10 volts. At 1.10 volts, 90% of the cells, 90% uh, of the modules, you can operate reliably if you keep the latency at 10 nanoseconds, but for 10% of the modules, you should increase the latency to 12.5 nanoseconds. Make sense? Because those, mo those modules are operating slowly. You should give them more time. Now, as you, as you push the voltage lower, the curve starts shifting upper and to the left, as you can see over here. So at one point, I don't know, 0 0.75, 1 0.075 volts, only 50% of the modules can operate reliably if your activation latency is 10 nanoseconds. 40% can operate reliably if your activation latency is 12.5 nanoseconds, and the remaining 10% forget about operating them at this voltage. Makes sense, right? So basically, this curve is nice, I think. Well, I think I already said all of this. So you can see the lower bound of latency uh, is 2.5 nanoseconds. Again, we can adjust. We have, we have a granularity of adjusting voltage. We also have a granularity of adjusting latency. We cannot see the behavior. Uh, within a 2.5 nanosecond interval, clearly. That's why we have this uh, blue, uh, blue band over here. Okay, but basically, the takeaway is the same as spice simulation. This is real result. DRAM requires longer latency to access data without errors at lower voltage. So let's, let me show you this picture again. This is uh, theory, and this is practice, basically. It's essential the same. Okay. So there's more data in the paper that I'm not going to go into, but this is also uh, showing there's some spatial variation, spatial locality of errors. There's some banks 
uh, that are much more affected by reduced voltage. For example, if you reduce the voltage by 12% in this particular module, you get errors in only three banks. And even in the banks, you can see some uh, interesting distribution of errors across rows. This is not easy to explain, of course. It could be due to process manufacturing variation. It could be due to some design variation. We don't know exactly. It could be due to the uh, reliability of the voltage rails going into different banks. Who knows at that point, because we don't have visibility inside the DRAM chip, but clearly there are some variation that's observed. Some, some banks are much more reliable. So I can, if you know this information, you can also exploit this actually. So areas concentrate in certain regions. Okay, so based on all these findings, this paper proposes what is called Voltron. Essentially, uh, the idea is to uh, have some performance loss target because you're gonna lose performance if you actually are not operating at the highest voltage, right? Uh, clearly, if you reduce the voltage, unless there's a huge margin in the voltage, at the, at the point, if you, if you operate below the V min, which is the point where you cannot reduce voltage without actually uh, getting performance loss, I redefined women in this case, uh, you, you're going to lose performance. So user provides some performance loss target, and the system automatically sets the minimum DRAM voltage without violating that target. So how does it do that? Basically, you need to have a mechanism to predict the performance loss. Well, you need to have these curves. You need to have these curves, first of all, to figure out uh, how latency behaves and how much you can reduce voltage reliably without inducing errors, because in this case, we don't want to induce errors. Uh, and also, you, you may want to have this curve also, uh, at least this information, so that you can map data nicely, let's say. And you also need to predict performance loss due to increased latency. And this is a hard part also. This is performance prediction. It's always hard. Uh, and we basically built a model in this case. It's a linear regression model where you provide some application characteristics and the DRAM voltage and the curves that you show, uh, the reliable latency curves for different voltage levels. And then this model gives you a predicted performance loss. It's not a perfect model. You can think of this as a neural network also. Well, linear regression is an early statistical method that approximates a neural network, let's say. Maybe I, I pushed myself too much by saying this, but in a sense, neural network is a statistical method to learn relationships between inputs and outputs, right? And linear regression is another method of statistics. So we did not go into the neural networks over here, but I believe you can actually make this performance model much better with a neural network clearly. Uh, so in this case, we have some accuracy in our linear regression model, but I think you can make this uh, performance prediction model much better basically. Okay, and then uh, what this outputs is some minimum voltage. Uh, um, sorry, basically you, you basically have a predicted performance loss and you compare it to the target and you basically figure out uh, the voltage that you need to use uh, to actually uh, satisfy the predicted performance loss. Okay, I'm not gonna go into the details. Again, the paper has a lot of details on how this works, but these are the results. So the results are actually quite good, I would say. Uh, MemDVFS is a prior work. In fact, it's our work. We did that at Intel. Uh, well, it's, it's almost 10 years ago, 12, 11 years ago now, it was published 11 years ago, where we actually were changing the voltage and frequency at the memory controller. We're not changing the voltage and frequency of the chip, DRAM chips themselves. We're just changing the voltage and frequency of the memory bus. So it's, it was good, but it has limited applicability on workload. So you can see that its savings are relatively low. Uh, that was on real systems also. Uh, but here you can see that uh, the, this is overall energy savings in the entire system, CPU plus DRAM. It's significant, 7%, especially when you have high intensity workloads. So the prior work did not do well in high intensity workloads because it required changing the voltage and frequency of the memory bus. And if your workload is high intensity, you keep sending stuff on the memory bus and you don't wanna change the voltage and frequency of your memory bus while you're sending stuff on your memory bus. That's why it doesn't buy that much performance with high intensity workloads. It exploits the idleness on the memory bus. Whereas this mechanism is something completely different. It doesn't rely on idleness, right? It's really exploiting the fundamental characteristics of the DRAM device in terms of its latency and voltage relationships and also the application's tolerance to uh, performance loss uh, due to the voltage latency curves, right? Okay, and uh, you can see that the, you lose some performance, but overall you meet the performance targets. So in, our, in this case, the performance target we had was 5%. We cannot tolerate more than 5% performance loss, but we do most of the time better, basically, 1.8%. I think the maximum performance loss was 3%. So the system is doing well, but I think you can still do better by optimizing the system more. Okay, so 
hopefully this gives you another perspective of latency, voltage, energy uh, optimization together. And I think this is fascinating. This is real, basically. In, in a real system, you need to take into account uh, energy as well. Sometimes your goal is optimize performance. In that case, this probably doesn't apply. But usually your goal is to optimize, uh, uh, get, a, get to a sweet spot between performance and energy while uh, not violating a target performance, let's say. Okay, so the advantage of this work is you can trade off between voltage and latency to improve energy or performance, or both, a sweet spot. And it, it can exploit the high voltage margin present in DRAM. But you, you did see that the voltage margins are not as high as latency margins. Clearly, there's disadvantages like every work, right? Uh, or every idea. It requires finding the reliable operating voltage for each chip. And again, this is higher testing cost. It requires finding those curves. That's also higher testing cost, right? So higher testing cost is unavoidable. But again, if you have an intelligent memory control, you can do everything that I described online again as well. So there's no reason why you cannot do these things online. But it, it takes time. More complicated memory controller. And if you're interested, there's a longer version uh, of this, uh, again, which was delivered as uh, a guest lecture uh, in one of the past uh, years. And you can, of course, read the uh, papers as well, paper as well. Okay, let me talk a little bit more and then uh, we'll conclude uh, this part and then we'll talk about memory controllers. So there's a lot of other interesting things you can do. If you actually now freed your mind, let's say, uh, to think about latency as something that's not fixed, that's not a given, but something that's fluid, that's controllable, that affects your reliability. Now you can do other cool things. And I'm gonna give you examples of other cool things. And I think there's a lot more research to be done in this area as well. And we've been doing some work on using memory for security. Uh, for example, you can exploit the latency reliability re relationship to generate two random numbers. I'm gonna talk about this briefly. You can exploit this latency reliability relationship. Uh, as you reduce the latencies, you get errors. And some of those errors may be identifiers of the DRAM device because each DRAM, DRAM device has some unique fingerprint in terms of the error rate. But you need to be you do it carefully, of course. Some cells actually uniquely identify the DRAM device. And if you find that, that becomes a physical unclonable function, essentially a fingerprint of the device. And this could be useful for authentication purposes, for example. If you want to authenticate uh, an IoT device, you can basically... Uh, look at the physical, uh, generate a physical unclonable function and see whether the fingerprint of the device is actually, a, is actually the same as the fingerprint that you expect. Of course, this requires pre-recording those fingerprints somewhere in some database, but I'd recommend thinking about this as I think fascinating also. The same phenomenon can be exploited also to generate two random numbers, meaning com something completely different than a fingerprint, right? Almost exactly opposite of a fingerprint actually. So I'm going to describe that. And you can also quickly destroy in-memory data. Uh, we will probably have a talk related to actually two of these over here. Uh, again, these are cutting edge research topics. As you can see, some of these papers are published in 2021. Right? So this is the physical unclonable function, fingerprints. I'm gonna defer, refer you to uh, this lecture and the paper. But again, as I said, as you reduce the uh, latencies, some cells fail. And if you identify those fail, uh, failing cells, uh, failure patterns uh, that form a fingerprint that, that is stable for a chip that forms a fingerprint for the chip, basically. But those failure patterns need to be stable. So you need to profile those cells to be stable. That's the idea over here. I'm going to give you the exactly opposite idea, which is this random number generated, generation idea, uh, which is fascinating. Again, we claim that this is true random numbers because this is completely dependent on a physical process. There's no artificial process that we use to actually generate the random numbers. We're, we're sampling some physical phenomenon, which is the noise and the sense amplifier potentially. We don't know exactly what that is also, but our, uh, uh, our hypothesis is that we're sampling the noise and the sense amplifier, and that is enabling us to generate true random numbers. So let's take a look at this actually. Let me give you the quick summary. I don't intend to spend a lot of time over here, uh, but basically true random numbers are good for many reasons. Uh, it enables system security. There are many use cases for randomized algorithms, for example. And true random numbers are actually much more secure than uh, uh, pseudo-random numbers. And many systems do not have dedicated true random number generators hardware, but they have DRAM devices. So DRAM devices are actually very common. And also processing in memory systems may need true random number generators so that you can actually do security functions inside the memory. Right? This is something that is not discussed in the paper. 
But there's something perhaps more important motivation to have random numbers inside the DRAM site. Like whenever you actually come up with some fundamental mechanism like this, reviewers question, well, why do we need more random numbers? Why do we need high throughput random numbers? We actually get this a lot. From my perspective, if, you can, if someone comes up with a new mechanism to generate higher throughput, low latency random numbers, and it's a new mechanism, that's good. I'm not going to question, why do I need this? Why do I need that? Someone 10 years down the road may say, OK, I like this mechanism. I'm going to use it. Right? That's how science progresses. But I think, unfortunately, there's some mentality that's present in science today that it has to be immediately applicable. And you have to be able to justify that immediate applicability. I think it's extremely dangerous for science. I'm getting at the viewers over here, as you can see. <laughs> but that's extremely dangerous for science. If someone comes up with a new mechanism that's fundamental and that is new, don't ask the question, what is this applicable for? You may not know. I may not know. Nobody may know at that point, right? That's what fundamental science is all about. Five years down the road, 10 years down the road, maybe 20 years down the road, who knows? Someone will come up with a way of exploiting that mechanism. So the fact that you don't know why, uh, where this could be applied or why you need more uh, true random numbers, et cetera, should not be a limiter to reject the paper, for example. And I think this is very dangerous today, unfortunately. People somehow want this immediate gratification as reviewers. If you're giving me a mechanism, you should always give me where I can use it. You should always show me how much benefit I get uh, compared to existing mechanisms, et cetera. OK, compared to existing mechanism, I can show you some benefit. But don't, don't expect me to show you future applications that can uh, give you a better result, let's say. So I think that's a bit dangerous. But that's, that's, these are exactly some comments that we got uh, when we actually wrote this paper. But from a fundamental science perspective, who cares, right? Let's do it, then people will use it. OK, so let's take a look at it. Basically, uh, there, are, there were some current uh, DRAM-based true random number generators that are retention-based, retention failure-based. So it turns out, actually, you take a DRAM chip, you increase the retention times, uh, or you reduce the refresh rate, uh, and some cells fail randomly as you reduce the refresh rate. As a result, you can actually generate random numbers this way. But this is a very slow process, actually. Uh, that's the second part over here, basically. So our goal was to actually uh, to design a new random number generator that's high throughput, low latency, and let's say it doesn't have effect on concurrently running applications. But I'm not going to talk about some of these. You can read the paper. And the idea here is, if you reduce the DRAM access latency below reliable values and exploit DRAM cells failure probabilities, you can generate random values. Basically, find out those cells that fail randomly if you reduce the latency to some value. That's the idea. And again, this is based on real characterization of many DRM devices. And we show that this phenomenon is exploitable, and you can get a lot higher throughput than existing DRM-based uh, through, uh, through random number generators, and also a lot higher latency. You can see these are numbers between one to two orders of magnitude in terms of throughput as well as latency. Now let's take a look at what we find, basically. So uh, as you know, latency failures uh, come when you reduce the timing parameters, when you violate the timing parameters. A cell's latency failure is determined by random process variation. So from, from our, uh, what we know so far, it's a true random uh, physical process, basically. That's why we call it true random. Of course, we cannot prove it, right? How do you prove something is true random is always a philosophical debate as well. Uh, some cells fail randomly, basically. So let's take a look at this. I mean, you've seen curves like this before. This is time. This is bit line voltage. And this is half VDD. This is VDD. Uh, now, if we activate a DRAM cell that's charged, the charge gets perturbed, so you do the charge sharing. At some point, sense amplifier gets enabled. At some point, you can do a read, right, after some reliable uh, margin towards VDD. So this is TRCD. That's the activation latency. So there's a ready-to-access voltage level of the cell, basically, Vmin. We're going to call that Vmin. And there's usually a guard band, as we discussed earlier, which we tried to eliminate, right? Now, if you... Uh, so basically, different cells have different behaviors. This curve is not constant for every cell. Every cell has some different behavior. As we also saw, that, that was one of the reasons why we actually saw this variation. Uh, this is because process variation, as we discussed, right? There's unique behavior. Even if you don't change the read uh, latency over here. Now let's take a look at what happens. So some cells are basically strong. Some cells are weak, clearly. Now if you change the activation latency, push it to the left, 
you have some failure probability rates. And the interesting parts are weaker cells have a higher probability fail, and some cells are at the boundary, meaning some cells are close to Vmin, which means that because of, again, random, random perturbations that happen, sometimes they fail, sometimes they don't fail. So basically, if you push the latency hard enough to the left, reduce it, violate it enough, you will always find some cells. Well, always is maybe too strong. Maybe you push it over here, then <laughs> you will not be able to find any cell that's randomly failing, right? But there is some uh, there's some place in the latency curve where you will find cells that are randomly failing, 50%. And the idea is to profile and find those cells over here. So the, it requires a profiling mechanism, basically, and in terms of memory controller again. And that's the idea, basically. There are some cells that have high probability of failing with reduced activation latency. There are some cells that have low probability of failing. We don't care about those. We don't want those. We want these cells. These cells that are randomly failing, 50%, very close to 50% when we reduce the latency. And if you find them, and which we do, we actually characterize the chips and we, we basically say how many cells exactly you can find based on our characterization. Of course, future work can do better than us, right? We did what was limited for us, but future work based on this information can do better. But we, we refer to these as RNG cells, random number generator cells. And the idea is to generate random values by repeatedly accessing RNG cells and aggregating the data read. So every access to the cell gives you a value, one or zero. And if you identify these cells truly uh, correctly, meaning they're failing 50% at every access, you should really get a random bit string after you access the cell. So if you want a 64-bit random number, access the same cell 64 times. If you have 64 of these cells that are generating random bits, access all those 64 in parallel and get a single 64-bit random number uh, but with concurrent access to all of those cells. So you can actually exploit this in different ways, as you can see. And basically, we show that uh, the randomness, the entropy is very high. I don't remember the number. It's more than 97%, I think. Uh, and the uh, random data that's generated satisfies the statistical test suite for randomness. There are these randomness tests that National Institute of Standards Technology have uh, created, let's say. And you can, I've already given you these numbers, basically. So latency is quite good. Throughput is quite good. And power is actually very, very good. You get only four nanojoules per bit, basically. So I think it's a fascinating mechanism. Uh, but you will learn about another mechanism in a guest lecture, I think, that does better than this. <laughs> Again, by not, it's not exploiting the same phenomena. It's not exploiting the latency reliability relationship. It's going to exploit something different. Yes, please. Um, just to make sure that I understand it correctly, are you looking for these um, random number generator cells in unused DRAM um, rows? Yes. Okay. So the, the paper talks about those system level issues, basically. Uh, like, how should, uh, how should you find these? Like, applications should not be using these, et cetera. But yes, unused DRAM rows or you dedicate some part of your DRAM for random number generation, you don't allocate anything for that uh, to those areas. Uh, could, could these rows be, like the rows with these cells be used to store data or are these cells so degenerated that they like can only be used to generate random numbers? I mean, normally, yes, they can store data, but we're reducing latency so that we can generate random numbers, yes. But if you, if you don't want random numbers, for example, you can use the nominal latencies and store data. And um, like with, with all the profiling we talked about for um, adaptable refresh rates and so on, wouldn't this kind of open a, like, I'm not sure if this is the correct term, a side channel attack, because you have all the profiling data in basically in software, so you know where these um, cells are. And Random number cells are. Behave, yeah. uh, well, uh, you know where the cells are, yes, uh, but you cannot reproduce the random numbers because these are truly random. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But yes, it will. It, uh, if, if someone uh, like figures out how to access this information as to which cell generate random numbers, they will know which cell generate random numbers. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The, the good thing is it's not reproducible basically in any way because it's not pseudo random ge random ge uh, number generation. It's really exploiting the physical phenomenon. Okay. So again, if you you can read the paper, uh, you can watch an earlier lecture. Uh, by Jeremy, uh, who's my PhD student. But you will uh, hear about this uh, better mechanism, let's say, doing better than uh, D-range uh, with what's called quark TRNG. And maybe I'll give you the key idea very quickly. Basically, uh, we found out that by concurrently enable four, enabling four rows, 
like four row activation, you can generate two random numbers also. So remember, we did triple row activation to do majority function in Ambit. With four row activation, you can generate random numbers. And I will leave you. And this is true. This is studied on real chips again. Real chips show that show this behavior. And you can uh, you will learn more about this, I think, hopefully uh, in a guest lecture by Atabert. Okay, so I, we're almost at the end. I'm not going to talk about other stuff that is quite interesting, but we really don't have time for because even though these are fascinating things, we cannot cover everything. Refresh latency is clearly important. We talk about refresh rates, but we didn't talk about refresh latency, right? There's a latency of refreshing also because you need to give time uh, for cells to be refreshed. And you can also reduce that. There's variable latency, refresh latency. You can read that paper if you're interested. You can reduce memory latency by exploiting memory access patterns. I'll give you the key idea of this very quickly because it's also very interesting, I think. Uh, basically, we, we wanted to reduce access latency with no modification to existing DRAM chips. It turns out this is not possible with no modification to existing DRAM chips. You need very slight modification so that you can uh, control something that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, but basically, the key observation is that if a row has already high charge, if it was accessed recently or refreshed recently, meaning it has already high charge, it can be accessed with low latency. So basically, a row's charge is restored when the row is accessed. So if you access the row recently, if you're going to access it again, activate it again, you can do a shorter activation latency in the second activation. That's the idea. A recently accessed row is likely to be accessed again because you have row level temporal locality that this paper talks about and uh, exploits. Basically, because of bank conflicts, some rows are activated a lot in DRAM. And the key idea is to track recently accessed DRAM rows and lower the timing parameters if such rows are accessed again. It's a very simple idea. It requires some tracking in the memory controller, basically only. That's it. So, and that's the idea of charge cache, basically. Low cost and no modifications to DRAM. Uh, I mean, there's, there needs to be some slight modification, but I'm not going to talk about that. Technically, there should be no modification, but DRAM has some internally timed circuitry uh, that violates what we're trying to do. That's why you need some modification. But that's a small modification, basically. And you get significantly high performance again. So technically, you should be able to do this only in the memory controller if DRAM was cooperative to begin with. And you get lower DRAM energy also because you improve performance. OK, again, if you're interested, you can watch a lecture on it, which is, again, a guest, a guest lecture previously. But this year's guest lectures will be different. That's why you're not going to be able to see this in the guest lecture. OK, there are other ideas that are quite interesting, which we don't really have time for. And I mentioned parallelizing refresh and accesses, which also reduce the refresh latency significantly. Power consumption. We did talk about voltage and energy, but we didn't talk about power. And we don't have time to talk about power, but this is another study that's experimental study uh, that basically shows that, uh, so you have data sheets and DRAM data sheets tell you some latency parameters as we discussed. And we said that this is not the true latency. DRAM data sheets also tell you some power parameters. And that's also not the true power. Meaning there's a lot of margin that's added to the power. So ba basically we wanted to verify how, how much margin there is in the power also and how much Let's say uh, DM manufacturers, for example, advertise they've been reducing power. How much of that is really true? And that's what this paper looks at. Basically builds a power model uh, of DRAM uh, based on real experiments. And this requires another experimental infrastructure that we built, uh, which took a lot of time, actually. A lot, several failures. Uh, two undergraduate students started this, uh, and they worked on it for a year, and they failed. And then they continued doing a little bit more and they built this better infrastructure. And uh, there you can, you can find them as authors of the papers also, Kais and Ragav actually. Uh, okay, but that's it, that's my teaser. <laughs> you can read the paper for more detail. It has very interesting results basically, but I don't have time to go over it. But let me summarize. Basically, we've talked about low latency and I think this is going to be a lot more important in the future. Hopefully you, how many people have watched Satya's keynote? Probably we don't have enough time. <laughs> I mentioned it yesterday, right? Satya's keynote, and I will uh, record. You can find it online. I don't know if the links are added yet, but PAs will know. Uh, but I would recommend watching it uh, to see more motivation from a different perspective, edge computing perspective. Uh, but I think this is going to be a lot more important in the future. And we've covered all of this so far. Uh, maybe the biggest takeaway is again, maybe it's very similar to what the takeaway was for uh, processing using memory, processing in memory, processing near memory, right? We basically need a change of mindset uh, to reduce latency. So far, the mindset was very different, right? Latency, because of the processor-centric mindset, 
DRAM is not designed for latency, and we have this fixed latency approach. If we change this mindset, I think there are a lot of interesting things that can be done to reduce latency as well as open new ground like true random number generation or physical unclonable functions, which can be useful for processing in memory systems, for example. And I think the second takeaway is also hopefully obvious because I've mentioned this multiple times. I think if you really want to truly reliably reduce latency, you need to do it online, meaning your memory control needs to keep profiling because we don't know, again, what happens over years, right, uh, to these latencies. And it's very hard to figure that out. So keep profiling once in a while and figure out uh, what your latencies should be. That's also true for the random number generation, by the way. That's, you need to keep profiling to figure out what your cells, uh, because random number, uh, sometimes these things are affected by temperature also. Uh, and we found out, uh, we look at temperature studies in that random number generation study, and you need to profile at different temperatures, for example, based on the operating uh, temperature. Okay, we've covered a lot of design principles. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about these, but more than anything else, we probably need open minds. So I think with that, we've covered all of this. Uh, well, maybe not the predictable part. We're going to talk about that, actually. Uh, but before that, we will do memory controllers in the next hour, let's say. Any questions before we take a 15-minute break? Or 16? No, we can do 16. <laughs> okay, so let's take a break. Let's be back at uh, 3.10, and then we will cover memory controllers. No. Yeah, only a quick question about um Yes, yes, please. The, I can the, hear you. Okay, great. So so uh, uh it's a question that came up yesterday, but today you also showed again in a in one of the graphs with uh, the random number generation, right? That uh -huh. I guess the uh kind of uh, at the circuit level we distinguish a zero and one with VDD half in DRAM, right? So zero, zero is zero, uh, one is VDD, let's say. Or yeah, 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 yeah. And we, but the, like we, we split them at, at VDD half, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. VDD half is the, uh, VDD half is the reference voltage basically. Right. And my, my, my point there is that at least the row hammer papers, I think so far have all shown that at the circuit level, the errors are really one-sided, and I, I'm not I'm not entirely sure anymore about retention uh, errors. But at least for row hammer, it's one-sided, so you never get you never get zero flipped to one in in at circuit level, right? So yeah. why don't we why don't we uh, split them at let's say VDD times zero point one because charged cells only ever get de decharged, but discharged cells never get charged. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure if Rohammer papers are the best uh, things to do that. I think if you if you look at our paper, Rohammer paper, I think we showed that uh, there is a you can you can get errors on both uh, ways, right? One to zero and zero to one. No, I I don't think uh, like if I recall correctly, they only show that you you get true and anti cells, right? And that's why. At, at I guess the the logic level, then it looks like you get errors in both ways. But I, I think sorry, I I, could, I couldn't hear you very well. Can you speak up a little bit? Uh, sure. Um, so at I think like the um, like the uh, one of these latest papers about uh, Rohammer right shows that you get true and there's true and anti cells in the modules. Uh huh. Yeah. And and that's why you get. Uh, errors in both ways, but yes, yes, absolutely. Ex except for a single, like they had one single cell in a single module, I think, where you got actually flips in both directions, but all others got uh, at, at circuit levels had only one to zero bit flips. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe Rohammer, uh, but uh, okay, uh, Rohammer is a different error mechanism than uh, retention or reading, right? So I think the insights, maybe, maybe what you say is true. Uh, I'm still skeptical. Maybe people don't test enough chips. Or maybe there's something uh, in the Rohammer vulnerability that makes one to zero more likely. I don't know. Or maybe uh, the true cells are much more common in current DRAM chips than anti-cells. That's also possible. 
Uh, but uh, okay, assuming that that's tr even that's true, uh, uh, that cannot directly uh, lead us to conclude that we should change the margin to 0 0.1 volt, right? VDD. Because you're looking at a specific mechanism like row hammer. Yeah. Maybe row, yeah, yeah. row hammers may be biased towards that, right? For some reason. De definitely. So, so I guess if, if we'd also need uh, retention errors to exhibit the similar exactly. behavior, right? Exactly. You need retention errors. Also, you need read errors to exhibit the similar behavior. If you actually change the, let's say, sensing or reference voltage, you should make sure that you don't get more errors, for example, compared to having the reference voltage at VDD over two. So this requires more testing. Maybe, maybe there's something to what you, maybe there needs to be some more asymmetry, but I don't know. I see. Thanks. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a, of course, of course you can, right? Uh, but uh, this paper uh, protects from that sort of thing uh, by uh, what, what it does is basically when you allocate a random number generator row, you also allocate some buffer rows around yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, in the paper, it's discussed basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a very exciting area, I think. It's very fundamental and I think there is a lot more work to be done. Yeah, it seems to like, I mean, here it just seems so obvious to do it, but uh -huh. yeah, it's just, just nobody follows it before. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe. Um, people looked at random number generation in DRAM, but they looked at retention errors, and the paper discusses clearly and compares to them a lot, actually. But th that's a very, very slow process. Like, you need, to, you need to basically wait for 40 seconds to generate a random number, which yeah. probably you don't want, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'd recommend reading the paper. Yeah, and... yeah, it's just, yeah, I don't know. It's almost fascinating. Because, um, yeah, I don't know. It just seems, yeah, it's so fascinating. Sure. <laughs> I can't really explain why. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, I understand. I mean, it's a fundamental mechanism that's. Uh... Yeah, it just seems so trivial, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially with processing in memory trend, we need some mechanisms to uh, naturally generate random numbers on the memory side, right? And that has been some, something that's been ignored. Are there other um, That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, if, frankly, I don't know, but in many consumer devices, usually you don't, right? Yeah. That's... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have pseudo random number generators, of course, but. Uh, they're easy to, easier to, let's say, reverse engineer. <laughs> and also they're predictable, right? Once you give the same seed, you're going to get the same random numbers. And <laughs> yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, you do need some memory controller support. The memory controller needs to change the latencies and also a buffer. We, we, we propose some buffering of the random number generator, uh, generate random numbers, for example. The paper talks about that, but I didn't get a chance to have the time to talk about it. I mean, you could do an FPGA-based system, basically, <laughs> clearly by changing your memory controller, but uh, not, unless you have uh, some hooks into your memory controller, you cannot do it in an exact existing uh, CPU-based system. Oh, I mean, we, uh, we don't do that. We basically say, okay, this memory is reserved for random number generation, so nobody touches it. Yeah, but you could do what you said also, but it's just additional overhead, right, for managing the system. Cool. Sure. Uh, sure. Next semester, and I just wanted to ask, um, with the timeline, or I have pretty much no idea how to, to approach this. Um, would I contact you? Yeah, yeah. Like I think. Uh, I mean, it's better to contact sooner, yeah. and maybe email me and Juan and other people. Just give an idea of the t topics yeah, yeah, that I you're interested in. On your website yesterday, and so I, I could just email the, the people there 
Sure. Now and yeah, yeah, please CC me also. We usually ask for your CV and uh, transcript. That's it, basically. And if you're, of course, taking this course, and if uh, yeah. what's your name? <laughs> okay, so, okay. Uh, well, you took my earlier course also, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, I remember your name. Yeah. But probably not your face because you took yeah. it during, during <laughs> the yeah. pandemic, right? <laughs> because I didn't see anyone, basically. Yeah. Okay. Essentially. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember a lot of like I have, I'm, I'm always fascinated by my um, the number of student professors at ETH. And, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Awesome. Well, I think uh, you you made comments probably. That's why yeah, I remember yeah. your name. Yeah, you were asking questions, and yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Clearly, that's the reason. <laughs> Otherwise, a lot of students take the classes, right? Yeah. But but yeah, I mean, if you're uh -huh. sure. Yeah, I was and, just wondering whether. Like when it's too early no 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 it never it's okay. never too early i mean of course probably you cannot start right away yeah, because you're taking awesome. courses etc yeah but at least yeah. sure yeah. at least we can because it always takes some time right to meet yeah, etc yeah. you can start at least some meetings and maybe maybe thinking about some topics if you're interested in random number generation yeah. DRAM, for example yeah, that, that's why I'm mm. now sure yeah, I mean, uh, not every topic that I'm interested in is listed online, of course, right? So you could also propose your own topics or uh, that's, I'm very open to that because we, we, we list some topics, but they're outdated or we don't have time to up upload the bachelor's or master's thesis topics. Well, I, I don't have any uh, great idea, right? Sure. No. But you may have some potential directions that you're interested in, right? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah, so we and transcript also, please. That that helps. <laughs> okay. Right, sure, you're welcome. Do you have any examples for the masters or I think uh, both of them would be good. Yes, I, I guess you're interested in also. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah, both of them would be good. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Just just an online version of your transcript. It doesn't need to be official or anything. <laughs> Uh, yeah, myself and Juan would be good. Uh, you know Juan, right? That's, and then the people who are listed in the pos uh, potential projects. Uh, there's also, I think, a Safari thesis uh, email uh, list. You can also send it there as well, in addition. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, the more people you send it to, the better it is because <laughs> you know how it goes, right? <laughs> it's a faulty process, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, potentially. I think that's something to think about also, like how, how ECC affects the random number generation. Yeah, this is something to... This was not on ECC chips, that's right, yes. If, if you have an ECC chip, then yeah. Yeah, I don't think any of our characterization was, uh, was done on NDM ECC chips. So Minesh would be a good person to talk about, actually, as, as he's done. All of the topics that he has covered in his PhD thesis uh, that affect... Uh, error, error profiling will affect random number generation also if you have NDRM ECC that's not exposed. Good question. Yeah, let me get some air.
started. I think so. Fix this. Okay. It's not working. Let me just make sure. Okay. That's also good. Okay, so we've been talking about memory controllers quite a bit. So it's kind of odd to title this as memory controllers, I think, but we're going to go a little bit deeper into memory control and uh, look at why it's actually a quite hard problem uh, and talk about some machine learning techniques, reinforcement learning techniques to uh, make it, let's say, more tractable uh, uh, in, instead of having human uh, techniques, let's say. Okay, so hopefully we'll be able to finish uh, this lecture on time, but we'll see. But basically, we've been talking about memory, uh, and DRAM, a lot of the ideas that we discussed are all applicable to other types of memory technologies also. So don't think that just they're just applicable to DRAM. In some cases, we've shown applicable to other technologies. In some cases, we have not. But uh, ideas are fundamental enough to be generalized, basically. And memory controllers are, again, no foreigner to this, basically. All memories especially long latency memories have similar characteristics that need to be controlled. And this lecture and many of the discussions we had so far use uh, uh, DRAM as an example, but many scheduling and control issues are similar in the design of controllers for different types of memories. These are flash memories. And I, I'm going to actually point you to a bunch of lectures on flash memories. I don't know if we're gonna be able to cover that this semester. I always feel like we need to have more lectures, but we don't have time for lectures, clearly. And other emerging memory technologies like phase change memory, which we will hopefully be able to cover in, in the next weeks. And spin transfer torque magnetic memory, uh, for example. Intel 3DX point is a phase change memory, for example. Uh, they all have memory controllers and they all have similar characteristics uh, with some differences, of course, uh, that need to be controlled. But other technologies, uh, also place other demands on the memory controller. For example, flash memory is an endurance problem, meaning uh, when you write to a cell, you degrade the cell. So you can only do a limited number of writes to a memory cell. In some flash memories, it's 1,000 writes, for example. In some flash memories, it's 3,000 writes. So this clearly is a big limitation of the memory technology. Right? It's, like, it's called an endurance problem that exists in phase change memory also. That doesn't exist as much in spin transfer torque magnetic memory. But with different trade-offs, you can actually enable it to exist, let's say, in some memory technologies. So basically, uh, that's a problem that flash memory and phase change memory need to deal with. And the controller becomes more complicated to deal with it, right? There are other kinds of problems that I have shown you earlier, but I'm going to also flash again, uh, uh, like read disturbance. That's true. That's much, more wor much worse in flash memory, for example, compared to DRAM. And the controller needs to take care of it. Right now, we're arguing that controller needs to take care of it in DRAM also, right? The row hammer uh, problem, for example. So in a sense, there are similarities across these different memory technologies. And if you understand different memory technologies, then you actually become much more capable of developing techniques that are much more fundamental and general, in my opinion. Uh, as I mentioned, for example, our experience with flash memory uh, motivated us to study DRAM read disturbance errors, for example. So I think it's fascinating, basically. Hopefully, we'll have a lecture on flash memory uh, that will talk about some of the other demands. For example, flash memory has uh, asymmetric reads and writes. A DRAM read and write latencies are symmetric. But in flash memory, reads are faster than writes, uh, 10x faster, sometimes 100x faster. Uh, you, uh, you need to erase an entire block, let's say 256 pages. So these are interesting demands. There, there are good reasons for doing so, for cost reasons. But now the memory control needs to be very careful, right? If you're scheduling an erase command uh, before a read command, what do you do, basically? If you're, you're going to delay the read command much longer uh, because the erase command takes a long time. So there are a lot of interesting decisions that the memory control needs to make because of the technology-dependent characteristics. And this is an example of memory control. I, I will pick flash memory since we've done a lot of work on flash memory clearly. So these are similar to uh, uh, DRAM controllers, except they're flash memory specific, obviously, today. In the, but, but they also have DRAM inside, 
uh, there's this buffer manager, which we will go more into. That's a DRAM buffer. So in a sense, a flash memory also has DRAM inside, DRAM controller inside. That's multiple controllers. In the future, I think this memory system or storage system may become even more heterogeneous. It can consist of multiple uh, memory technologies to, to store data. But basically, they do much more, uh, these controllers. You can see that they do complex error correction, uh, wear leveling because of endurance issues. Different cells have different wear out characteristics. They've been written at different uh, number of times. Wear leveling means that you try to equalize the, num equalize the wear out of different cells or pages so that one cell doesn't go bad right away. All cells at the, uh, close, to the, uh, close to the same time, they go bad at the same time, basically. That's better management. They do voltage optimization to actually uh, minimize the error rates. They do garbage collection, which I'm not going to get into. If you get into it, then it's going to be uh, the flash memory lecture as opposed to uh, memory controllers lecture, pager mapping, et cetera. So they do many, many things to adapt to the characteristics of uh, the underlying technology. So you can see that it's a full system, actually. If you look at a, a solid state drive controller today, it's like a full system. You have a processor, uh, you have some hardware engines, uh, some reconfigurable blocks potentially, uh, and DRAM, DRAM controllers, and an interface to uh, the host system, which could be PCIe, for example, but it could be different kinds of bus protocols. So I find this fascinating, clearly. And there's a flash translation layer also, basically. This, this is from a paper that we wrote in 2012, which proposed uh, using refresh to actually get rid of retention errors in flash, for example. Uh, but of course, it needs to be, even refresh needs to be flash memory specific, basically. DRAM refresh is specific to DRAM, but uh, flash refresh needs to be specific to flash memory. And again, we'll hopefully talk more about this when we talk about flash memory. But this is a more recent and a better drawn picture. Uh, this was from a paper that we were invited to the right uh, for proceedings of the IEEE, as you can see. I'd recommend reading it, but maybe not right now, unless you have spare time to read. Uh, but you can see that uh, there are processors here. There's a DRAM manager buffers. There's compression engine. There's a host interface. This is uh, connected to the host. This is the real picture, and this is the, uh, let's say, schematic. Uh, you can have data scrambler. You have ECC engines. These are hardware, basically. And these are the channels flash, uh, for the flash chips. I think it's very interesting. And this paper gives a good overview of the SSD controller as well as the error mechanisms and how to, how to correct and tolerate them. Uh, it's a, essentially a summary of the work that we have done for six, seven years until 2017, let's say. But we did some work after that also. That's not included over here. And this is a picture that I showed you earlier, right? You can see flash memory has a lot of error mechanisms. Different memories have different error mechanisms. So PE cycling is the wear out mechanism, basically program erase cycling, endurance errors, program errors, cell-cell interference errors, data retention errors, read disturbance errors. And there are different techniques that the controllers employ. So you can see how complicated the controller is, basically. If it employs all of these techniques, Many of these controllers do actually employ a good chunk of the combination of these techniques. As a result, they are complicated. So now you can see error management is a good function of the memory controllers, uh, and flash memory is an example of it. And this is a more up-to-date version of that paper that, was, uh, that appeared in this Inside Solid State Drives book. So if you're going to read one paper, I would recommend reading this one. And we haven't updated it since then, unfortunately. I would like to update it with more recent, uh, let's say, results. But uh, if you're interested in SSD controllers, uh, there are a lot of works that we have done. This is a simulator for modern SSD devices, and this is being used by people in academia. I see papers written with it. Uh, scheduling mechanisms are important on SSD controllers, and this is an example that provides fairness and performance at the same time. We're going to talk a lot about that for memory later. Uh, this is a mechanism that tries to uh, make sure it provides security support for data data sanitization support. Whenever you erase a block, the data should not be available to other people who may want to get their hands on that block, basically. That's the idea. Or, or reallocate a block, not just erase, right? Uh, erase is the wrong word, actually. Whenever you remap a block, the data should not be leaking to someone else. Uh, and there are more recent works where we try to optimize the read, retry. Jisung uh, has been part of these works. Mohammed has been part of some, in, uh, some of the other works, work on SSD controllers. And there's more to come, basically. So if you want to learn more about this, this is a long lecture uh, that is concatenated from two lectures uh, that talks about the flash memory. And flash memory is interesting because it's uh, three-dimensional today, basically. As I mentioned in an 
uh, earlier uh, lecture, uh, scaling, technology scaling has become very difficult in the two-dimensional planar flash memory. And as a result, manufacturers actually had a breakthrough. Uh, I think Samsung initially started this vertical NAND, which is 3D stacking of the uh, flash cells. And they had a breakthrough because technology scaling became a lot easier if you actually build 3D stacked memories. We'll see if that breakthrough happens in DRAM. I'm not fully convinced it will happen, but in flash memory, it did happen. So there's no reason why uh, it may not uh, happen in DRAM also. So whenever you go, you can, you, can, you can create another dimension to scale, you can ease some of the technology scaling issues. This doesn't mean that this 3D stack memory uh, doesn't have a lot of uh, reliability problems. And our, our later papers, which I didn't mention over here, actually cover some of those reliability problems. And we actually recently, Jisung has been uh, leading this uh, modern SSDs course, and this is a special course that we started this semester. And I think he's given four lectures on uh, flash memories and uh, their characteristics. If you're interested, you can also take that and or, or watch the course, if, even if you don't want to take the course, right? Okay, that's flash memory, which is interesting and exciting, but and this is an example of a complex controller, actually. But let's talk about DRAM. Uh, DRAM is arguably less complex, uh, but it's in a different trade-off space. Flash memory has a lot of latency, and the controller has a lot of time to make decisions. DRAM is a bit less complex. It's getting more complicated going forward into the future. But it's, it has, uh, the controller needs to make very quick decisions because the latency to the DRAM is very low right, compared to flash memory. So it's a, it's in a different trade-off space. As a result, a uh, controller needs to be extremely careful. It doesn't need to deal with some issues like endurance, for example. But even DRAM is interesting, right? Uh, DRAM has different types with different interface optimized for different purposes. We discussed this uh, last lecture, right? When we looked at workload DRAM type uh, characterization, right? So there's commodity DRAM. DDR5 is coming out. Maybe it's already out. I don't know. It was supposed to be out this month, I think. Uh, low power DRAM with a low power analog interface. Uh, high bandwidth DRAM with high bandwidth interface signaling. These are all signaling interface actually, interconnects and signaling interfaces. So that the interface low power, high bandwidth. Underlying microarchitecture is exactly the same as what we discussed, but the interface is very different between these chips. So it's completely different from an analog and mixed signal perspective. Uh, low latency DRAM, which we discussed, 3D stack DRAM, many types, and who knows what else, right? So basically, Across all of these, the underlying microarchitecture is fundamentally the same. And a flexible memory controller can potentially support various DRAM types. But this doesn't happen as we discussed last time, right? Because the, uh, this will complicate the memory controller. Both the characteristics are different. Uh, first of all, difficult to support all types or even two types and the upgrades to the types. Uh, and the analog interface is different for different DRAM types, actually. And this really makes it very diff difficult to support different DRAM types. And we discussed this yesterday. Uh, this is a very tough thing to do. And I will show you some pictures from, uh, in terms of what those analog interface look like in real systems. So this is, again, just as a reminder, this is our Ramelator paper where we actually modeled a lot of these different DRAM types. We will talk about simulation later. I'm not gonna go into it, but this, this is just to show you that there are a lot of different DRAM types specialized for different types of usage, use cases, as you can see over here, right? And you've seen a lot of new examples also, right? We've covered some of the proposals that we have. Uh, clearly this stops at 2015 because the paper was published at 2015, but you've seen many, many proposals also. And this was the picture that I showed you earlier, so I'm not gonna go over this. So clearly there are differences between these DRAM types. And you can actually model a lot of these DRAM types using Ramulator. We're adding a lot more to this, DDR5 is being added, for example, and I'd recommend looking into it. And this paper we covered already. But let me show you that, what that analog interface looks like. So according to AMD, at least, this is the memory controller. This is 2005 or so, uh, AMD Barcelona. And this is the DRAM interface. So you can see that that analog interface covers a lot of the DRAM chip. Think about this. This is just to communicate with DRAM. It's, it's almost as big as one core, right, in this picture just to communicate with DRAM. Because that circuitry needs to be high speed. It needs to be reliable. It needs to be, I mean, as much as possible power efficient. It needs to have pins to communicate with the DRAM banks. Uh, it needs to do the calibration of DRAM, et cetera. There are a lot of complexities involved. Plus the memory controller needs to manage a lot of things. So don't, ne don't ever forget, when you're thinking about going off chip, don't ever forget the analog interface, especially if you're communicating with a very high speed uh, device like DRAM. 
So we said that DRAM uh, is not low latency enough, right? But it is high bandwidth and low latency enough to cause problems in your design, basically. Meaning today's DRAM, for example, it's clocked at 3.2 gigahertz. So basically, uh, or uh, some transfers per second, I think many giga transfers per second. So this analog interface needs to be extremely high speed. Perhaps, I mean, it may be actually the uh, highest speed analog interfaces that we have in our systems today, at least in general purpose systems. I think that's true, actually. I think I can comfortably claim this. Okay. So let's take a look at some other chips. So this is at least based on the diary of pictures that some people came up with. You can see that uh, Apple M1 supports eight LPDDR channels. And you can see that they also occupy a lot of space, right? These are the channels. We don't know where the memory controllers are. Maybe, maybe they're around it, maybe somewhere. We don't know. Uh, I don't think people have reverse engineered it enough. This is, uh, according to AMD, the global memory interconnect you can see over here. It's significant space, as you can see on the die. Yes. If LPDDR um, is intended for mobile devices or um, low power devices, why would Apple use um, these chips for their um, like um, desktop or no? I think they put M1 into a desktop computer. Yeah, yeah, that's they... right. So LPDDR is actually quite power efficient. If you uh, go and read the paper we discussed, demystifying uh, workload DRM interactions, we, uh, we are actually very positive about LPDDR because of its energy characteristics. And I think it makes sense to actually put them into laptops like this because of the energy characteristics. Huh. My, my perspective is that, so, okay, there are two answers to this. <laughs> One answer is LPDDR is quite efficient, no question about that. In terms of energy efficiency, it's very hard to beat according to our results also. And I expect Apple to replicate our results and do their own studies. The second answer is, Going back to what I said earlier, it's easier to design one chip with one memory interface than adding another memory interface and also designing another chip. Exactly the same, but another memory interface, basically. My, my feeling is both of these reasons together compel them to use just one chip. Yeah, it makes sense to me, frankly. <laughs> uh, I mean, DDR is clearly higher, uh, uh, higher performance in some workloads, but in some workloads, actually, it doesn't matter that much because you gain energy efficiency and uh, that may be much more important to you, even uh, in workloads where you don't lose that much performance, right? Uh, because you're using a low power interface. Yeah, but that's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, but so high-end server system, even uh, people have proposed actually, even for very high-end server systems using LPDDR interfaces going into the future. Because again, uh, energy is a big deal. Uh, and maybe you're not losing that much performance. So this is actually interesting. This goes back to the discussion about politics. Uh, that we have in these standards committees, right? And uh, sometimes people question, okay, why do we keep pushing this DDR interface that is not low power, not high performance enough to be used as a GPU? Who's going to use this interface? And people are actually skeptical about DDR interface in general, not the GDDR uh, or not, uh, not, not the LPDDR, but LPDDR actually has a quite good uh, open future from my perspective because of the uh, low power signaling it has. Yeah, yeah, we can talk a lot more about it, but we don't have time. Okay, so if you look at, again, uh, you can look at IBM's Power 10, it's flagship chip, memory signaling, a lot of the, they have a different interface, they call it the open memory interface. In fact, in my, in my opinion, IBM is quite innovative, actually, even though it's a very old, let's say, bureaucratic company, it's quite inno innovative in how it deals with memory interfaces. It's still extremely processor-centric, but if you look at the signaling interface uh, and the memory interface, it's, it's what they call an open memory interface. And this way they can extend the memory capacity a lot actually, which we don't have time to go over it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an interface that's uh, more packet-based than, uh, let's say better than DDR, but you can attach DDR chips to it by connecting this to another memory chip, for example, or memory controller. Okay, okay let's talk about the ARM controller. So many, uh, clearly there's a lot of area dedicated to just the analog function. But there's also the logical functions of DRAM controllers that are enabled by the analog, right? You need to ensure correct operation, clearly, refresh and timing. You need to service DRAM requests while obeying the timing constraints and resource constraints of DRAM chips. And there are many, many constraints. We will see more. Clearly, there are resource constraints, bank, bus, channel, minimum right to read delays, uh, many different delays. 
I need to translate the request to DRAM command sequences. So you have a request that goes to an address and you need to translate to command sequences, right? Like activate, pre-charge, read, write, uh, and some, some other things. And you need to also do the refreshes, right? Uh, it needs to buffer and schedule requests for high performance and quality of service. It needs to do the reordering so that it can take advantage of the row buffer, for example. It needs to maximize the data uh, bus utilization if you want to get highest bandwidth possible. So it needs to do all of the management of the banks, ranks, and bus, basically. Clearly, correctness is a part of it, but performance is another part of it. So correctness is here. Uh, correctness is here. This is not for performance, right? And on top of this, it needs to manage power consumption and thermals in DRAM. So this is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. You, need to, you may need to turn on or off DRAM chips, manage different power modes. DRAM has some power modes we will discuss. It's not, it's not enough at all at this point. So that also needs to be rethought going into the future because the power modes are very coarse grained today, but maybe more fine grained power management can enable better energy management than DRAM. But even then, uh, still we need to do some management today. So that's why the DRAM control is actually quite complicated today. And a modern DRAM control looks kind of like this. It takes requests from heterogeneous uh, agents. It has an arbiter. It basically uh, it does some address translation, basically maps the request to different banks and channels, et cetera and does some command scheduling, reordering of commands, and then it uses the analog interface uh, to actually communicate with the chips. So all of this is the memory controller and plus more that is not depicted here, right? Power is clearly not depicted here. And we want to add more here, right? If you think about it, we want to add profiling, we want to add row hammer management. Uh, if you want to have ECC, there needs to be error correction codes. So it's going to become more and more like the flash memory controller but with tighter, much tighter and tighter latency constraints. So you need to be careful. So when we actually first wrote the memory scaling papers, uh, we, we called that we need to have a DRAM translation layer, meaning at that time you have the flash translation layer, which is broadly the flash memory controller. And DRAM is going to have a lot of these technology scaling issues. So we need to have a DRAM translation layer also, but that DRAM translation layer needs to be much more careful because it doesn't have enough latency uh, to work with because DRAM is much faster, basically. This is another picture from one of the papers that we have written. Basically, you have request buffers, and then you have schedulers. This is looking at the performance aspects, clearly, right? Uh, and as, as the number of requests that you put into the request buffer grows, the size of the memory controller also grows. So as you put more requests, meaning put more computation, the memory control also becomes more complex to support the uh, requests coming from different agents. Yes. Is the memory controller uh, made by the DRAM company? No, not today. So today uh, it's made by the per uh, people who manufacture the processor. So if you go back, it's part of the chip, right? Processor chip. Okay, yeah, because yeah, I was just confused because you said like- um, Apple makes memory controllers, for example. <laughs> yeah, because I was just confused because, all right, so firstly, like, these then can interface because of the standard, I guess, with yeah. the chips. But then yeah, like, yeah. Um, I guess, um, yeah, because you, you said that um, usually there's some rows that are just dead. Um, and so at the um, end of the process, um, the DRAM manufacturer remaps those dead rows. Yeah. Um, well, so that, that is done uh, by the manufacturer, yes. How do we open this? Oh, it's, it's open, okay. <laughs> so that means yeah. there, okay, so there must be an, another very simple controller as well um, inside of the DRAM chip. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So there's some reconfigurability, slight configurability. Uh, it's called post-package repair in DRAM, actually. Uh, it's basically uh, post-packaging, you, you can do some repair mechanisms inside the DRAM chip, yes. The okay. controller can have that capability also, potentially. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Guess, I was just wondering, like, like, all these things you're saying that um, it should be done by the controller, I guess, like, were you thinking, um, like, which controller were you thinking of? Or is oh, the one that's it was the always a memory controller. But again, uh, don't get too stuck on how things are done today, right? There is no reason why this memory controller cannot be on the uh, memory side as well. Right? Today, it's like this because we're very processor centric. Uh, processor is controlling everything, including memory. But there's no reason why this memory controller cannot be pushed to the memory side as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> Makes sense, right? But when we were discussing, for example, the latency profiling, it was all about the memory controller. Uh, it could be in this memory controller, it could be done if you have a memory control inside the DRAM chip as well. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, so uh, that's a good point. Basically existing DRAM chips have limited reconfigurability for repairing 
rows, but they don't have any control logic inside. There's some refresh control logic internally, uh, but it's not that interesting, let's say. It, it, it commands, the, it, it basically responds to the refreshes. Yes. I saw an idea then like, I guess like, or I guess a thought as to like, maybe why um, it'd be hard to incentivize the different parties um, to um, it, like to, to adapt these um, optimizations on DRAM uh -huh. because um, for the DRAM side, this would mean introducing um, like from zero to one, a memory controller, mm -hmm. if they wanted to, you know, improve their efficiency by 30%. And so, um, and so that's a really costly for them. And now from like the side of the processor people, well, DRAM mm -hmm. is only one component. So a 30% increase in the energy perform um, efficiency in the DRAM will probably be sort of like watered down by AMHIT's law or, or whatever it's called, where um, the um, performance inc improvements to get to one part of the system actually um, diminish greatly in terms of um, the entire system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically no one has in incentive to improve. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, I think, uh, yeah, it's a bit unfortunate. So it didn't used to be the case. Basically memory controller was uh, had its own chip in the past. If you look at 1990s, uh, there's a processor chip, memory controller chip, and the memory chip. Memory chips, let's say memory modules. Uh, so the reason memory controller went into the processor chip is because we were very successful with technology scaling. We have so many transistors. Oh, let's put the memory controller on chip. So that's called the integration, basically. We have this huge integration capability. That's why memory controller chips were consumed into the processor chip, just like other accelerator chips are consumed into the processor chip today. That's, processor chip is becoming humongous today because we, we are able to do that, basically. So there's a history behind this also. But yes, I think uh, you're right, uh, because of the way we have designed things, memory manufacturers, unfortunately, don't have capability or the mindset to design these controllers, let's say. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> uh, in a sense, they're, uh, not only their chips are dumb, their processes are dumb. <laughs> they, they cannot have this uh, uh, dumb, dumb meaning in a not, not bad way, right? In a, in a way that they just don't have the experience to do this, right? So they're not even thinking about it, let's say. And the process, from the processor's perspective, yeah, maybe memory control is extremely important, but they have also so many other things to deal with on the processor chip, right? Because they're very processor centric. So I think your thinking is essentially pointing out the problem we're at. Uh, even though this is so important, uh, it's, it's very hard to break that uh, barrier and put the memory control somewhere else. And also there are political reasons why you don't want the, why, processor manufacturers don't want to leave the memory control, right? They have the control. If you have the memory controller, you have the control of the system, right? You can keep the other memories as slaves as opposed to uh, something that's intelligent. So you will lose value actually if you lose the memory controller. <laughs> Think about it a little bit. <laughs> Even though they're hard to design, they're still better to keep if you have them. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so uh, DRAM scheduling policies, we've talked about these. I'm not going to cover a lot of them again, but, but there's first come, first serve. There's first ready, first come, first serve that we discussed, right? And the goal of first ready, first come, first serve is to maxim maximize robot buffer hit rate. We said that it's not fair. We talked about other potential policies, but scheduling is act actually done at the command level. Column commands, meaning read or write commands, are prioritized over row commands, activate and pre-charge. So now you know the commands, right? Activate, pre-charge. These are row level commands or bank level commands. Uh, whereas column commands are read or write. You read or write one column. And uh, that's how you prioritize it, basically. If you want to do row hit first, you prioritize reads or writes over activates and pre-charges. And within each group of commands, older commands are prioritized over younger ones. And we're not even talking about writes and reads over here. That's a whole, whole different issue, uh, as we will briefly discuss in a little bit. But writes and reads are also need to be handled carefully and differently. So I'm going to go through this rel relatively quickly. You know about the row buffer. You know about the fact that it acts as a cache. And this is the same animation that I showed you earlier. If you keep accessing the same row, you keep hitting in the row buffer. If you access a different row, you have to get a row buffer conflict. And as a result, you need to pre-charge the array. Uh, you need to activate the new row and you need to send a read command to read out the column. So basically this DRAM structure dictates the policies that you have uh, inside the memory controller. Okay, and we discussed that DRAM scheduling policy is a request prioritization order. And the prioritization can be based on many things. Again, I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can imagine many things. We're going to talk about prioritization, hopefully in a later lecture, even more from a quality of service perspective. 
But you can actually take into account many, many things, right? Age of the request, whether it's sitting in the row buffer currently or whether it's missing, what kind of request is this prefetch, read, or write, whether it's demanded by a load from the processor or a store, how critical it is, what does this mean? Is it the oldest miss in the core? How many instructions in the core are depend on it? Will it stall the processor if I don't service it for a while? How much slack there is in the request, for example? So there could be many, many things you can imagine uh, to keep track of. How much interference is this request causing to these, this, the other course? Uh, and who knows what else, right? So basically, this is up to your imagination, actually. Usually, people imagine less, meaning they want to keep it simple. Uh, as a result, the policies are not very adaptive, basically. Let's take a look at the row buffer. So clearly, there are row buffer management policies also. So you, you access a row. You can keep the row open after that access. This is called the open row policy. Now, this is good if the next access is to the same row. Now we get a row hit. But if the next access is to a different row, by keeping the row open, you cause a row conflict, right? You could have proactively closed the row immediately, and you would have reduced the delay for the next request that goes to some other row in the same bank, right? And it, by keeping the row open, you're keeping the circuit active. There's a feedback loop between the row buffer, sense amplifiers, and the cell. And that feedback loop keeps consuming power, basically. You're keeping that active basically. And as a result, you're wasting energy. So open row policies are usually higher energy, but could be high performance because of this first reason over here. It's if your applications are streaming through the same row, for example. The closed row policy is exactly the opposite. Closed row acts for an access, either immediately or you're a bit more intelligent. You just, you just look at the request buffer and you say, okay, if there's no other request to this row, I'm gonna close this row. That's a bit more intelligent, right? And now this is good if the next access is to a different row, then you avoid a row conflict, which is good. So if your access patterns are such that uh, you can, uh, you're conflicting a lot of the time, maybe this is a good policy. But if the next access needs the same row, you have an extra, extra activate latency. You close the row for, let's say, uh, you did the wrong thing by closing the row because some other access is going to come and access the same row, right? So if you could have predicted that, if you could have been a bit more intelligent, uh, you could actually employ a better policy. So many policies today are adaptive to some level. Uh, some policies basically try to predict whether or not the next access to the bank will be to the same row and act accordingly. But usually these policies are very, very simple. We can read some papers about it. Uh, in, in general, uh, people actually employ either open row or closed row policies. And uh, if they expect their spatial locality in the row is not going to be high, in many server workloads, for example, closed row policies are employed. But still, that's not necessarily a good policy because it has a downside if your spatial locality is high. Right? Okay, so I'm going to skip this one, but basically this shows, uh, this is a table that shows based on the policy and a first access and a next access, what are the commands needed for the next access? If, you're, For example, if you have a closed row policy and the first access is the row zero and uh, next access the row zero and the access in the request buffer, then you get a row hit. But even if you have a closed row policy, you don't close the row because the access is already in the request buffer. So you just need to issue a read command. So the memory control needs to keep track of this. This is the basics, basically, the very basics, row buffer management. And even this needs to be uh, a bit smarter, let's say, because it has significant implications on both performance and energy, as you can see. Okay, let me talk about power management quickly. So DRAM chips are power modes. For example, uh, the key idea is when you're not accessing a chip to power it down. And these are the power states. Unfortunately, they're very coarse grain. Active means highest power. Basically, you're accessing the DRAM chip. All banks idle mean uh, you're not accessing any of them, but uh, they're, uh, basically they're, they, the row buffers may be open. Power down means row buffers are closed. And self-refresh means you cannot access the DRAM chips at all. They're in self-refresh mode. This is the minimal power mode where uh, there's some refresh logic inside the DRAM chips that automatically refresh the DRAM chips independently of the memory controller. That's the idea. So this is the lowest power. So this is the level of intelligence that we have in the DRAM chips. They can refresh themselves, but they cannot do much else. But they have to be put in this self-refresh mode. For example, my cell phone right now is in self-refresh mode, I bet. Hopefully. I hope it's not an active mode. Well, it cannot be an active mode. I hope it's not an all banks idle mode, for example. That would be wasting a lot of power right now. If it's in self refresh mode, there's an order of magnitude power difference, at least uh, between the second mode and the last mode over here. 
So there's a huge power difference. So it, you can you can basically have a state diagram between the transitions from these uh, for for the transitions between these states, and each state has a power value, and the transitions have latency values, meaning how long it takes to transition from one state to another state. Right. Clearly, getting out of the self refresh mode takes some time, but not too much time to actually cause myself a problem. Let's say when I interact with the uh, it's microseconds basically. It's not nanoseconds clearly. So basically, that's the trade-off. State transitions incur latency during which the chip cannot be accessed. Uh, so DRAM controller needs to be aware of this and uh, manage the transitions, essentially. So I think this is interesting, but we don't have much more to cover over here, since this is an area that's not as well explored, partially because DRAM chips are not good at supporting these power modes in a fine-grained manner. Let's talk about the difficulty of DRAM control. So clearly, you need to obey the timing constraints for correctness. And there are many timing constraints in DRAM, more than 50. For example, you have a write to read delay, minimum number of cycles to wait before issuing a read command after a write command is issued. So you issue a write command. You cannot issue a read command to any bank. It doesn't matter if the write is going to, the read is going to the same bank or not. Why? Because the bus is one way. You need, well, it's bi-directional, but you can, you can drive the bus only in one direction at a given time. The interconnect is really your limiter again over here, unfortunately. So if you want to issue a read command after a write, it takes some time to, let's say, stabilize the bus such that the bus can be turned around. This is also called the bus turned around, the turn around delay, such that you can go into the read mode from write mode. So this is why DRAM controllers actually have operate in uh, uh, consecutive modes. Re, uh, they do read batches and then write batches and then read batches and then write batches and then read batches and then write batches. And then they switch between read and write modes based on some thresholds. For example, how full is your write queue? How many, uh, uh, how many data needs to be written to DRAM at this point? If your write queue is uh, fuller than some watermark, higher watermark, then ba basically you say, OK, I'm going to switch to the write mode now. And then I'm going to drain some writes from my queue. And then if I've drained enough writes, meaning the write queue is uh, low, uh, high, uh, lower than a Low, uh, low watermark, let's say, low threshold, then I'm going to switch back to the read mode. This way, they try to amortize uh, the cost of switching between uh, this TWTR. There's also TRTW, read to write delay, basically, switching between read to write. So that's one example, right? It's, it's a bit unfortunate, but that's, that's the uh, physical reality you're dealing with. You have this interconnect. You can either write through this interconnect, or you can either read from that interconnect. You cannot do both at the same time because they shared interconnect across different banks, right? Okay, TRC is the minimum number of cycles between the issuing of two consecutive activate commands uh, to the same bank. This is really activate to activate delay, right? Clearly one activate needs to finish and the bank needs to be pre-charged before you can actually issue another activate to the same bank, right? This is probably more obvious based on what we know so far. And imagine more than 50 other timing constraints. In fact, in some cases, 100. Okay, that's, th that's just timing. Right? There's also many resources to keep track of, channels, banks, ranks, data bus, address bus, row buffers, as we discussed, some of them. You need to handle DRM refresh. You need to manage power consumption. Uh, you need to optimize for performance and quality of service. Uh, reordering is not simple. And fairness and quality of service needs, as we will discuss, as we have discussed in memory performance attacks, for example, they complicate the scheduling problem, basically. It's not just about performance. It's not just about energy. It's also about quality of service. What if you need to satisfy this frames per second in this hardware accelerator. But if you need to have a very strong latency guarantee in your machine learning accelerator to detect a pedestrian, these need to be actually done, right? And memory control is a part of it. So these are some example timing constraints over here. Uh, and these are in terms of DRAM cycles. So multiply this with many nanoseconds because DRAMs are slower than processor, especially at that time. Uh, but you can see activate to pre-charge. I'm going to give you actually a pictorial view of this. So for example, uh, these two papers I would recommend, the SALP paper we discussed, the tiered late DRAM paper, they actually do a very good job on uh, describing how DRAM operates, much better than data sheets and much better than anything else I have seen. That's why we wrote these papers actually, well, at least the background sections to discuss. Uh, for example, there's an activate to pre-charge delay, that's TRAS. There's an activate to activate delay, that's TRC. There's just pre-charge delay, how long you should wait between pre-charge and activate. These are data sheet values, of course, right? We discussed that there's timing margin in this, and that's true, absolutely. Uh, 
So there, uh, TRCD is what we discussed, the activation delay, activate to read delay. How long, how much time should a uh, time needs to pass uh, before you can read uh, from activated row. And you can see the values associated with it. And the DRM controller needs to know all of these values. And it needs to basically make sure that it doesn't violate these, unless you employ the techniques we discussed earlier in the lecture. If you employ the techniques we discussed earlier, it, even compl it, it complicates the memory controller more clearly, right? Even this is not easy, I would say. Basically, you need to have some expertise in designing these controllers. In fact, I have some stories about that. Uh, so uh, how many of you know the name Chuck Tacker? Charles Tacker? Nobody? Nobody knows about the early pro, uh, personal computers, like the Xerox Alto system? Oh, OK. We need to teach computer history here, maybe. <laughs> but uh, before the personal computer revolution happened, people were actually doing research in personal computers. Like one of the earliest computers was the, called the Xerox Alto system. It was developed in Xerox labs in the United States. And Chuck Thacker was one of the pioneers uh, in computing. He personally was responsible for developing, well, he had the ideas of developing these personal computers that have, for example, uh, multi-programmed operating systems, uh, as well as uh, time-sharing systems. This is 1960s we're talking about. Uh, and Xerox Alto was one of them. And he, uh, be because of these, his contributions to the field, he won the Turing Award in 2009. He was also my colleague at Microsoft Research while I was uh, doing uh, computer architecture, while, while I started the computer architecture group over there. So we interacted a lot, actually. Uh, why we interacted a lot? Because at that time, he was designing uh, memory controllers for an FPGA board. And we were doing a lot of research in memory controllers, and we were discussing a lot. And I remember him saying very clearly that these memory controllers are the worst and most difficult things he has ever designed in his life. <laughs> this person who essentially created, uh, let's say, together with colleagues, of course, uh, first uh, prototype personal computers. He was also responsible for developing Microsoft's tablet PCs, which were way ahead of their time, if you think about it, right? Today, we're using tablets. Microsoft tablet PCs were actually uh, his idea in 1990s, let's say. Clearly, it didn't take off at that time, partly because Microsoft didn't do a good job in <laughs> enabling them to take off, perhaps. <laughs> but uh, clearly, tablets are everywhere today. Right? But this came from some, someone who knows how to design complex systems. So th this can tell you about the complexity of memory controllers today. It's a bit unfortunate. Uh, there could be a better interface to design these memory controllers, I think, but we don't have them today, unfortunately. Maybe that's a, a discussion for a, a next lecture, actually. But I want to finish this lecture. So let's take a look at why do we have so many timing constraints? Why not basically say, OK, memory, uh, I want this request. Just give me the result whenever you can. That would be nice, right? That way that we can simplify the memory control. That's an asynchronous interface. So the memory controller then doesn't need to remember all of these timing constraints and try to schedule things. That's a very higher level abstract interface. And I kind of like that. It's, it's an asynchronous interface. Uh, it may even not even specify. It, memory, here's a packet for you. Decode it and figure out what you need to do and send me the result back. Right? That's a packet level interface, higher level interface, as opposed to this very, very fine grained command level interface. And I think it's good to reconsider those interfaces going into the future. This is one of the reasons why progress is very slow. We have this very a nitty gritty interface that's dictated at a very fine grain level and nobody wants to change it at this point uh, because essentially it's limiting our progress and once you change something you need to change your memory controller etc uh, but if you have a very high level interface asynchronous that can actually enable a lot more innovation going into the memory space but of course uh, that goes back to the issues that you were saying for example now the memory controller perhaps needs to be on the other side right if if all you're doing is memory here's a request for you give me the result. Then the memory controller probably needs to be on the other side and memory needs to deal with internally these things, which I think may be a good option actually. Right now, memory controller deals with this internally. Uh, well, not internally, externally from memory. And it needs to deal with it because we want to optimize the latencies. So there could be another way of actually designing the memory controller also. Have a fixed latency for everything, right? Figure out what's the maximum latency, write, read, I don't care, activate, I don't care, pre-charge, I don't care. As a memory controller, all I want to know is I'm going to send a request, either write or read, and I want the data back, or I want the confirmation that it's done, right? 
So basically, I have a fixed latency or not even a confirmation. Basically, say, I'm going to take an action on memory and I'm going to assume it's going to take 500 nanoseconds. And that's it. I don't want to deal with any of these latencies. That solves the problem also, a complexity problem. But clearly, that's a terrible option, right? Because you need to pick the highest latency of any action that you can do on memory if you want to have a single latency parameter that exacerbates everything that we were doing to get rid of the latency, right? So that's another potential interface, a single latency interface, I call it. It's still synchronous. You don't need communication between memory and the, the memory controller other than memory controller sends something and says, I'm waiting. I'll get the result 500 nan uh, nanoseconds and that result will be correct, right? That's the idea. That's synchronous, single latency. Bad for performance, good for complexity. This is synchronous. You, you, you basically have different latency parameters and you still wait a determined number of cycles for a given action, right? Clearly, or for a given two consecutive actions. More complex, higher performance. And then the asynchronous is completely different at that point, right? Asynchronous is basically, you don't care about the latencies, you just get an acknowledgement or a negative acknowledgement from the memory controller saying, I've done your request and here it is. That could be high performance actually. Uh, and that could be not so complex on the processor side also. Internally, complexity needs to be handled anyway. So basically maybe an asynchronous interface is a good place to think about today. In the past, DRAM interface used to be asynchronous uh, as DRAM, let's say, evolution happened and po politics evolution also happened, they became more synchronous and they became very rigid today. This, you're looking at the rigidity of the DRAM interface today, basically. This is just an example. You're seeing basically different kinds of delays, right? You have the, uh, you, you basically, so why do we have these timing constraints? So that we can actually optimize for latency, right? We can minimize the time we wait between two different activates. We can minimize the time we wait from uh, a row command uh, from a read to a pre-charge, for example. We can have different latencies and we can optimize those latencies. But they're rigid because uh, the memory control needs to obey all of these. Okay, and the other paper also talks about it. And this uh, problem is becoming worse, actually. The memory control design is becoming more difficult. Uh, you can see, I, I've shown you this picture before. We have heterogeneous agents, the main memory interference between those heterogeneous agents, many timing constraints, many goals at the same time. So if you go back to Apple M1, which I would like to actually at this point, because it looks like a system like this. So this slide 39 is essentially what you see in Apple M1. <laughs> Even though that slide uh, 39 was constructed, let's say maybe 10 years before. <laughs> yeah, basically that memory interface is shared by, as you can see, heterogeneous cores, GPUs, neural engines, uh, some, some of them go through the system level cache. Some of them don't go through the system level cache. We don't know exactly, uh, but that picture and this picture are quite similar. Maybe that doesn't have hybrid memories yet, but it will. Uh, okay. Okay. Let me quickly, very quickly give you the idea of maybe more self-optimizing memory controllers. I'll, I will hopefully not take too much time, but I think this is important uh, based on what we've discussed. So clearly it's difficult to design a policy that maximizes just performance. Forget about quality of service energy efficiency for a while. Because you have all these constraints and correctness requirements, even performance is not easy to optimize for. So we discussed FRFCFS, for example, oldest first policy, switching between writes and reads. Are those good policies? I will argue that they're not actually. They're actually pretty suboptimal if you think about an optimal scheduling policy, which is hard to think about also. So as a human, it's very hard to think about an optimal scheduling policy actually, even think about it, but let alone design it. There's just too many things to think about. You're dealing with all of these timing constraints and resource constraints uh, and what kind of performance metric to optimize even. And workload changes the behavior. Sometimes they have streaming access patterns. Sometimes they're random access. What are you optimizing for, right? Your policies may not work. Sometimes they have a lot of writes. Sometimes they have a lot of reads. The read-write balance changes and the thresholds that you add into your system may not be good enough, right? And the system behavior clearly changes also. So basically our dream was, wouldn't it be nice if the DM controller automatically found a good scheduling policy on its own? Basically we want to schedule requests to maximize system performance. And th that brought us to self-optimizing memory controllers. This was something that I started with my intern, Engin Epek uh, at uh, Microsoft Research in 2007. 
and we published the work in 2008. Uh, and the, well, I, I already gave you the problem. It's difficult for human designers to design a policy that uh, can adapt itself very well to different workloads and different system conditions. We want to design a memory controller that adapts scheduling policy to workload behavior and system conditions using machine learning, basically. And the observation, I think it's a very nice observation, reinforcement learning maps nicely to memory control. It's not a deep neural network. This is a whole different machine learning uh, paradigm, reinforcement learning, as we will see. Uh, memory control is an um, uh, agent that interacts with its environment and learns basically over time a good pulse. Deep neural networks would not work well, in my opinion, over here. Uh, memory control is, is, I already said this, it can dynamically and continuously learn and optimize, uh, employ the best scheduling policy to maximize long-term performance. So let's take a look at it. So all of us are reinforcement learning agents, actually. We all are human beings. Uh, and uh, as Paolo has shown with dogs, uh, we can associate uh, system states and rewards. And then uh, system states with, uh, and our actions taken in given system states with the rewards and basically optimize our actions to maximize, let's say, our rewards, right? And uh, another simple principle, like I have, uh, I have a stove. And if I touch the stove, I get a reward or punishment. And based on that, I decide whether or not I touch the stove next time in a given state, right? So that's reinforcement learning, yes. Okay, <laughs> it's clear, okay. So basically, uh, you have an agent that interacts with the environment and in a given state, it takes an action based on what it knows so far. Uh, and then environment gives it a reward based on that behavior. And agent over time learns to associate system states uh, and a state action pairs with rewards, long-term rewards. And then it can learn to take the action that maximizes the reward in a given state. That's the idea. And there are my, uh, many forms of reinforcement learning. Uh, a vanilla form, let's say, is employed in this paper. Uh, and scheduler is seen as an agent. Environment is a system, processor, memory controller. It could be even workload. Uh, and basically, you have some state attributes that you observe. And you have some actions you can take based on the current state, you take an action, meaning schedule a command, and you observe the data bus utilization and you get a reward. If the data bus is utilized, it's a positive reward. If the data bus is util not utilized, it's a negative reward, let's say. And based on that, you try to update your table such that in a given state, you take the action that maximizes the long term data bus utilization. So you can do this for the immediate term or the long term. And there's uh, like reinforcement learning theory that describes how to do it to maximize long term rewards by uh, essentially discounting uh, past uh, rewards that you have seen over time. Okay, I'm not gonna go into the details of reinforcement learning. This paper actually provides a nice description of, very quick description of reinforcement learning. If, if people are interested, I would recommend Sutton and Bartos uh, reinforcement learning textbook uh, that was recently updated in 2018, I think. It's, it's a beautiful textbook that talks about it. Okay, so that's basically the idea. Uh, of course, how do you do that is the question. Basically, uh, the, the memory control dynamically adapts to memory scheduling policy via interaction with system at runtime. It associates system states and actions, commands with long-term reward values. Each action at a given state leads to a learned reward. And you schedule the command with the highest estimated long-term reward value in each state. And you continuously update the reward values for state action pairs based on feedback from the system. So if you, for example, get a positive reward, you update the state action pair to have a higher Q value, it's called a Q value. This is called a, a particular form of learning is called Q learning. So it's table-based. You, you have a lot of tables that you update. And in this table, you store the, uh, what the state action pair, uh, the, the associated long-term reward value with a given state action pair. So that whenever you're in a particular state, you look at all possible state action pairs associated with that state, and you pick the action that maximizes your long-term reward based on what you've learned previously in the past. So it's a very powerful form of learning mechanism and I recommend learning about it. Now, people are very excited about neural networks, for example, today. In my perspective, neural networks are actually quite dumb learners. They're statistical mechanisms. I mean, this is also statistical mechanism, no question about that. But here, uh, it's much wider, basically. Neural networks are very good classifiers, for example. But here, the action is not classification. The action that we're trying to take is really how do we improve performance? That's not a classification task. We're not recognizing anything. I mean, we could be thought of recognizing uh, actions to take in a given state, yes, but 
that is very much dependent on the environmental conditions and workload. So the training set is very, very difficult to uh, create, let's say, if you want to create a neural network. And I don't really know how to create it. But reinforcement learning maps to this very nicely. This is a very nice Markov decision process, for example. The memory controller can be thought as a Markov decision process that's moving from states to states uh, based on the actions. And Markov decision processes are probabilistic, clearly. And also, you have the exploration, meaning uh, all machine learning techniques should benefit from exploration and exploitation. Uh, I think new, deep neural networks have a problem with this, frankly, uh, a bit. What does this mean? Uh, meaning you have the exploited, uh, you have what you learned that is encoding your tables, right? And you can exploit it. But you can also say, and humans do that actually, you can also say, okay, I have stuff in my tables. Right now I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to try to explore. So I'm going to take a completely different action at this point. And I think that's very powerful. And we have actually this incorporated here. You take a completely different action once in a while so that you explore the state space and state action space. And I think that actually enables us to be much more flexible as well. One more thing I will talk about. It's not just a given state. So state is encoded. You can encode the state very rigidly, but you can also generalize it. So there's a lot of generalization that happens in this learning. Meaning you don't have to see exactly the same state uh, to take an action that maximizes your reward. You can generalize in the state space, and this actually can be achieved with hashing in the hardware. Because if you read the paper, you will see what I mean. Okay, so these are the guts of the paper, basically. This is the reward function, simple. These are the state attributes. It's, they're discovered via feature selection. They could be automated. Uh, they could be done dynamically also. We didn't do it over here, since this is one of the very early works on this topic. And then these are the actions. You can see actions. These, are, these need to be carefully constructed by humans, clearly, that, who are designing the thing. But humans don't dictate the policy here. Humans, uh, human provides the actions, which are easier. No op could be action. Also, you don't nothing, basically. Uh, for example, you don't close the row buffer. You do nothing. Uh, so in the anticipation that some other uh, request may actually access that row buffer. State attributes, this could be automated. The hard part, the really, really hard part is the reward function in general. Uh, because you have a goal and you, have, you want to maximize, let's say, long-term data bus utilization. In this case, it's easy. You get a plus one for read write commands, zero at all other times. But if you want to actually have some other goal, you need to specify your reward function very, very carefully. In general, in my opinion, actions, you need to do it carefully, yes. But in, you have a limited set of actions in a memory controller, clearly. Uh, state attributes, I think, of course, for example, we don't see, have the actions refresh over here, but refresh needs to be generated regularly. So whenever it's time for refresh, things get refreshed. <laughs> So we don't basically generate the refreshes based on probabilistic processes, clearly. Uh, state attributes, that could be done automatically, but reward function, that requires a lot of human uh, interaction. Okay, and these are the performance results. Basically, the takeaway is you get much better performance improvements and robust performance improvements over many human design policies. And the paper has a lot more results. And I think this is uh, actually a very good direction for designing memory controllers and controllers in the future. So let's uh, analyze this a little bit. I know I'm taking over time. We'll start next lecture a little bit later or something like that, sorry. But I want to finish this. Uh, you feel free to go if you want to go. You can always watch it online. We're almost done. I just want to finish the uh, analysis of this. And hopefully you can read the paper if you're interested in this. We'll assign it as a potential reading. Uh, the big upside is this. You have a challenging and changing environment and you do continuous learning. Your policy is never constant here. Whereas if you think about the policy that's employed in this, it's constant. Somebody designed this policy, I don't know, five years, six years, 10 years ago. It's the same. It doesn't change. This thing has seen a lot. It's still dumb as a brick. <laughs> I think I keep saying this these days a lot, but it is, a, it is dumb as a brick, right? It's very good, but it's not learned anything, basically. So this is an example where you cannot learn based on interaction with your environment, right? Uh, and you're not as much dependent on a training set. That's the beauty of it, I think. Your training set is what's happening, as opposed to your training set being whatever you trained your neural network on. Right? That's why reinforcement learning maps nicely here. And of course, I think the second uh, benefit is you have reduced designer burden. Uh, the design, designer's job is not to dictate a policy anymore. The designer's job is to specify what system variables might be useful, what actions to take, and what target to optimize, but not how to optimize it. Finding the policy is the responsibility of the machine learning agent, not the designer. 
Of course, there are downsides. How do you define, uh, specify different objectives like fairness, quality of service? Later works actually tackle this. There's a work that talks about quality of service, which is good. Hardware complexity is always a question. We, we discuss hardware complexity a lot in this paper. You can take a look at it. It's more complex than existing controls, of course. Nothing comes at, for free, but intelligence comes with complexity also, in my opinion. Maybe more importantly, uh, it's difficult to integrate this sort of design into the hardware design mindset and flow today. So if you think about how design is done in hardware today, there's not much room for uh, intelligent agents. Basically, you need to give inputs, you need to get outputs, and you need to know what inputs lead to what outputs, right? Here, you have an agent that changes over time, right? How do you test this agent, right? How do you test this hardware block? And that's just test. How do you verify it? How do you trust it? Not from a security perspective, but from a design perspective, let's say. Maybe even a security perspective should be thought about. But from a design perspective, how does a hardware designer who is extremely used to designing these bricks get used to designing intelligent agents that they cannot easily test, right? And I think that's a huge design mindset problem. And that's one of the reasons why it's going to be challenging to adopt such ideas. But I think they need to be examined and adopted. And this was our approach. And I think this is an example of the self-optimizing or data-driven computing architectures that I mentioned at some point. But this is just an example of how arch architectures need to be more data-driven. So if you think about it, this is a data-driven arch uh, architecture. So if you think about system architecture design today, the controller designs, cache designs, prefetcher designs, memory controller designs, hardware thread scheduling designs, pick whatever, whatever we put into hardware and mainly what we put into software also, they're human driven. Humans design the policies, they dictate how to do things. As a result, they're very simple, short side policies all over the system. You don't have automatic data driven policy learning. You cannot easily adapt to workloads and environmental conditions. Basically, <laughs> I think dumb as a brick is a, is a good reasonable approximation. There's no learning. You cannot take lessons from past actions. Uh, now, uh, if you're taking digital design and computer architecture, I've talked about perceptron branch predictor, right? That's employed in some systems that employs a very simple uh, one layer net, 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 network, which is the perceptron, which is the earliest approximation of a neuron, if you think uh, about it from 1960 by Rosenblatt. And that is employed in some branch predictors today, actually. And that's one example of where we have some learning taking place. But in other parts, we don't have any learning. So the key question is, can we design fundamentally intelligent architectures? And I think of the memory controller that I described is a step towards that, basically. So I think this is what an intelligent architecture might look like. You want data-driven. Machine learns from the data. It learns the best policies, how to do things. Machine, uh, over time, optimizes its policies based on the data. As a result, it's sophisticated, workload-driven, changing, and far-sighted policies. And this is automatic data-driven policy learning as opposed to someone dictating the policies and that those policies uh, being, let's say, carved in stone in hardware. And as a result, all controllers are intelligent data-driven agents. I believe we need to rethink the design of all controllers, actually. We're just starting this, frankly. Uh, maybe we're too late, but better late than never, right? And hopefully in a later lecture, you will see a paper that was published in Micro a couple of weeks ago. And my PhD student, Rahul Bera, it's his first paper in his PhD program. And it's basically applies similar principles to a hardware prefetcher and sees actually quite good benefits as well. I believe we need to apply similar principles. It doesn't have to be just reinforcement learning, but I believe reinforcement learning is a good fit, frankly, for adapting to the environment and workload. Uh, but maybe there are other forms of learning that need to be uh, discovered and also applied to other controllers. Okay. So uh, this is probably a good time to stop. Basically, we've covered the data centric. I've given you a glimpse of the data driven parts of uh, machines, but we also perhaps need to be data aware, which I will talk about later. Okay, this is where we should stop, I think, because we're already over time. But maybe this is a good place to think about how we're designing our system. So if you think about nature, if you know something about brain, I can guarantee you that this is not processor centric. There's a lot of connectivity here and there's a lot of computation and communication and memory being together in a specialized way, a lot of specialization. I don't claim to know all of this clearly, and I don't think humanity can claim to know all of this at this point, at least in the history of humanity. But we can clearly say that this is not based on a single principle like processor-centric principle. I think this is very much data-driven, actually. There's a lot of learning that takes place uh, in, with interaction with the environment, as we have seen. Uh, so I think if we 
going back to uh, that Satya's keynote, if we want to design machines that can overcome, uh, that can be even better than this. Clearly, we're better than this in some tasks, but it's a very limited set of tasks, and we cannot call it intelligent, intelligence tasks, right? They're number crunching tasks. And even number crunching, there are some really, really uh, smart people who can do it very well, right? So these are some idiot savants, if you will. They're uh, autistic people. They're actually very good at it. So there's some capability inside this thing that can actually do number crunching really well also, uh, except we don't know how it operates, perhaps. Uh, but basically, uh, this thing is probably based on some principles that we're not really exploiting in our systems. And maybe that's a good place to stop and maybe you can think about this a little bit. And we're claiming we're designing intelligent machines, but we should probably be thinking harder. Okay, any questions? You, people can feel free to leave. I think if your colleague wants to ask questions, feel free to ask questions. I'll be here, but anybody else can leave, frankly. Yes? Is there any fundamental? So yeah, like the paper that you, that you showed from 2008, uh -huh. so it's been around for um, like 13 years. Yes. Um, it's not been adopted yet. Is yes, that, <laughs> there are many papers that have not been adopted, even though they've been around for 20 years, even though they're good ideas. <laughs> yes, is there any fundamental weaknesses or is it just that yeah. before, um, when this paper was published, the delta between um, what was heuristically determined by human designers and the true optimal was actually not that large huh. in the design space? No, no, I think, I think the, as, as, as we discussed, like the downsides over here are actually big downsides, right? It's not easy to adopt an idea like this. It's really changing, disrupting the design flow significantly. So all of these downsides are actually real downsides. Oh, I don't think there's a big performance downside. Performance is actually quite good. And we, we didn't actually do, do a great job in exploring the performance. The performance actually is, in my opinion, even better than this. So nobody questions the performance benefits. There's a lot of analysis, but uh, the difficulty is really these three, I would say. Yeah. Like, because the memory controllers are not just about performance today, right? There's also quality of service, fairness. Uh, there's also energy management. How do you incorporate all of that complexity? Uh, I think it's doable, but there needs to be more research to be done uh, to enable that. I mean, this is obviously a concern. People always push back on hardware complexity. Even though it's an important problem, people don't want additional hardware complexity. This is overall conservatism. But I think this is also real. Like, how do you actually... Uh, make a hardware designer trust this thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, right now, if you design the block and if you have very well-defined mechanisms for testing that block, you know for a given input, I'm going to get this output. If I don't get it, there's something wrong. So I should go back and debug it. Well, well it's, very it's a bit more difficult here, basically. Yeah. At least in the longer term design, uh, longer term, right? Uh, well, like, of course, you can set all of the inputs in your table and <laughs> expect something to happen. Yeah, but <laughs> I see, I see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see, I see. Basically, your point is maybe the performance benefits are not enough to overcome. These downsides. I was uh, to, like, going into the future, do you think that the performance, like the, 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 the delta of performance is the true optimal, like uh -huh. the machine learning people approach, or versus the human designer? The human designer. Yeah, yeah. Will it not grow larger? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think so. Basically, yes. Uh, I would argue yes. Okay. This paper didn't test heterogeneous systems, also. Yeah. So, but again, that needs to be demonstrated in a better way. And it was demonstrated in this paper. Okay. Yeah. Be see if, like, 300% is quite high, <laughs> especially if you're talking about averages. Yeah. On some specific workloads, yes, you can. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I think maybe. Uh, Performance benefits will also be more compelling over into the future. Not maybe, I'm pre pretty sure about that. But that doesn't mean that people will still adopt it because these are actually quite strong reasons.
Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, but I think both are valid ways of doing research because you cannot uh, do everything experimentally, right? Yeah. Clearly, it's not possible for us to design this memory controller within reasonable uh, limits and timeframes right. right. uh, and show results with real applications. So simulation is a great way of actually evaluating these ideas. And yes, uh, I mean, usually open sourcing your simulator helps. But again, there may be bugs in your simulator, right? That's always uh, possible. But I think both, both, both ways are actually acceptable ways of uh, making progress and evaluating results. Okay. Yeah. If you can, if it's possible to evaluate using experimental relatively easily, it's always good to do that in addition to simulation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, and, and I think in the past, uh, there have been cases where people really just uh, did not know what they were doing with a the simulator. They just fed some values into the simulator. They got some results without questioning them. I mean, that, that sort of thing also happens, right? Yes. That's why you trust, you build trust on uh, some particular papers and some particular research groups more than others <laughs> over time. <laughs> there, that's one way of answering it. And the, uh, the other aspect of the answer is, usually uh, ideas are more important than let's say exact simulation results. Right. Uh, maybe the exact simulation result is like, let's say 5% off, 10% off, I don't know, because of those errors you mentioned. Hopefully it's not completely off. <laughs> maybe maybe what's important in the simulation or or even system results is the trends. Uh, your mechanism improves performance over the other mechanisms consistently. Okay, maybe I don't care about the 1% to 5% as much in the results. That's another take over it. Of course, this depends on your purpose, right? If your purpose is the advanced state of the art by enabling new ideas, this is a good approach perhaps. If your purpose is really to understand exactly how much difference is there between these two mechanisms, and that's not a good approach, right? Then you should really uh, trust the simulator a bit more. Yeah. Yes, last two questions. Like, I guess that's a correlation between what? Wait, uh, linear correlation between what and what? I don't think it's linear. Where where do you get this from? Which I like? Guess, I guess yeah. I guess you're correct. I guess no. like, it never really fails to improve its energy. I see. Uh, you mean DRAM latency or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I mean it makes sense, right? Because you're getting rid of the inefficient inefficiency in access, right? Because the longer you wait, the more energy you're consuming. Yeah, even stalling because you're wasting uh, some uh, static energy, right? You're still powering up the chip and you're, there's some static energy that's wasted, leakage energy that's wasted. But then like for that one paper, there was a discussion of these different performance and, uh, uh -huh. um, and the energy saving. But for that one, I'm assuming that it's not stalling. Or not, there's, there's no delta in the fact that it's stalling. Uh -huh. uh, what's the screen I'm not getting? Uh -huh. um, Yeah, I think uh, it, it depends on the paper and the workflow for sure. You should look at the paper okay. <laughs> because I don't I don't remember the exact uh, reasoning and evaluation results also. Exactly, exactly. Performance is a complex equation, right? Uh, not performance, I mean like the energy efficiency. Uh, exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. And both are complex equations in the end. You may be improving energy efficiency, but you may not be improving performance because you may be overlapping a lot of requests uh, to begin with, right? Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, but I think you should probably read the paper and let me know if the answer is in the paper. <laughs> Since you're interested in it.
Very simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what, that's what it is basically. You read the paper, you will see something similar. But the goal is to maximize data bus utilization in this case. So from that perspective, it's a simple, a simple and tractable reward function. Okay. But that may not be your only performance goal in a real system. So my question was, uh, do you Uh, so you're saying, uh, can you design better reward functions? Or well, I just want to understand. <laughs> I'm not even Yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, that's a good question, basically. Can you reduce performance, for example? If you, so in this case, the worst thing would be reduced performance, right? But in this case, we, we didn't see any uh, such issue because in a sense, it's a simple and clean and analyzable reward function. If your reward function was more complicated, potentially, yes. But our goal was data bus utilization and we didn't see uh, any cases where your performance actually reduced in this particular case but again it depends on your system like we didn't run the system for quality of service critical workloads right so if you have heterogeneous workloads some of them are quality of service critical but they don't utilize eight of us well they may be penalized by this reward function in that case you need to really rethink your reward function if, if you're running such uh, in such a system Okay, thank you. Thanks.